Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever the case may be. For all of you listening out there across the crazy planet Earth, welcome to Vestiges After Dark. And I am your host, Bishop Brian Willett, coming to you live from the deep woods of Western Georgia on this October 3rd. 2023. Tonight, back by popular demand, we have Regan Forston with us to talk about the afterlife, to give us updates on his research. And we don't really have a guest on this show that knows more about afterlife research than he does. So it's always a wonderful and fantastic thing to have him with us. And so he will be joining us on the second and third hours to discuss afterlife and take your questions. Um, but of course, in the first hour, we're going to have our uh, liturgical libations and uh, also questions from the ether. Don't go away. I hope you're all having a wonderful time right now, uh, and I hope you're about to really sit in and get ready for a fantastic episode of Vestiges After Dark. We have a great one for you. Um, of course, we got to start off, though, with liturgical libations, and this is one that I have supplied from uh, my travels. This is an international edition of McKellen, the McKellen, I should say. Um, it is the Lumina, and uh, it's really uh an interesting story because um when i purchased this the first time um i was on a ship and uh they broke it they smashed it actually by accident um and it was the only one they had left so i never got to take that one home and uh, so my father-in-law um works in norway um about once a month and so I asked him, I said, when, you're, <laughs> when, you, when you walk by the duty-free shop, can you pick me up another Lumina, please? And he did. So this is from my uh, father-in-law. Thanks to him. And uh, if you could just bring your glass over, uh, yes, Jamie. Yes, I'm ready. All right. Sorry, Daniel has a question. All right. Here you go. So this is the, oh. this is the McKellen Lumina. And uh, this is, again, you can't get this in the normal market. It is strictly a international edition only you have to be traveling out of country to get this i think you're going to like this one mckellen is considered to be the rolls royce right. of scotch now oh, isn't that just wonderful mm. and y'all know i'm not a scotch person but that's good i would drink this <laughs> It is sweet. It is it's, sweeter. Well, that's probably why I, I like it. I do like it sweet. Yeah. A little sweeter. A little more like a bourbon mm -hmm. in that sense. But but you can tell this is not made with corn because it yeah. has that it has that uh, barley um, Ooh, flavor to it. With that air a little bit. That that's a uh, yeah. That's the that's the McKellen Lumen. Not bad. Not bad. Yeah. Okay. Num let's nums. get. Yeah. Yeah. I thought we'd we'd uh, enjoy it. See, I. I, uh, when the bottle gets down to about the last third, I decant it. I put it into a decanter and, uh, these are special decanters for that purpose. And that's so it doesn't over oxidize because I usually will have several bottles open and I don't drink scotch every day, po you know, despite popular belief, I actually don't drink a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a prolific drinker. Like it looks, I do have a glass of wine or two with dinner. Um, and I do have a, port 
at night, maybe one glass at night, sometimes two. Um, but I don't drink a whole lot and I don't drink a whole lot of hard liquor unless I'm on vacation or celebrating or doing something. Um, so I have a lot of bottles of scotch open in my collection at any given time. And as they get down to that last third, if you leave them in the bottle for too many months with just uh, with two thirds air, it starts to oxidize and the flavors um, become muted and uh, it starts to go bland. Yeah. Um, you might not detect it if you don't drink a lot of scotch, but if you have a developed palate, you'll definitely tell the difference between a fresh bottle and one that's been oxidizing. So in order to prevent that, I decant it into a smaller container so that there's less uh, whiskey to air ratio and it preserves it um, quite well, actually. So that's what that's all about. And this bottle is now empty. Um, T time to move on, I guess, right? Time to move on, on to, to the a next new one. one. Yeah. You never know what I'll open next. Okay, so uh, we've got uh, coming to us from Down Under, Father Chris Yates. How you doing tonight, Father? Hello. Yeah, I'm pretty good. Um, we, we, uh, we've officially started uh, daylight saving time here, so I'm <laughs> even one more hour ahead of you. So again, My... if you want to know the future, just ask me. See, you're um, like a prognosticator. I mean, we can we don't need psychics. We just talk to you. <laughs> That's yeah. right. I'm on a horse, <laughs> I'll tell you what tomorrow's like. That's right. Yeah. All you need is a TARDIS, so, so, and we'll be we'll be all set. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And so far, 95 Fahrenheit. So um, oh, okay. You know, it's uh, we pretty much went from from. Um, all, uh, from winter to summer like, like that. that. We're, we're kind of doing a similar thing. We went from summer to fall <laughs> very, very quickly. It's and getting to it. like the 50s around here. So yep. it's yeah. like perfect temperature for going out and having a cigar yeah. and... Fire so, pit. Yeah, yeah. Windows open at night. Well, I don't do that just well, because I'm, of the... I'm, the, I'm oh, from man, that temperature. The ragweed I mean, will kill me if I did that. <laughs> yeah. Regan, Regan would know from my accent that I'm far more um, at home in cooler, wetter environments than I am yeah. where I currently, currently I, live. Uh, I, I'm but, the same. But I have learned, you know, the, the great comedian Billy Connolly once said, there's no such thing as the wrong sort of weather, only the wrong sort of clothes. Yes. So uh, <laughs> I, have, I have learned Fact. to wear linen. Yes. Um, so um, yeah, so that's the the classic mistake that that ponds make when they get here is they they rug up and wear layers because that's what you have to do in England. But then mm -hmm. when you come here, you realise that for the whole of the summer you only need one layer. One layer. Yeah, <laughs> I can understand that. I, the I adjustment. Just, I'm the same. Uh, my way. libation is water again. I'm, I know it's. Uh, I let the side down, but it is because of the time difference. Well, I mean, you're uh, in the you're in the future. You can't be drinking whiskey right now. I mean. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It's a big responsibility being in the future. Sober. We'll uh, drink it for you. Don't worry. <laughs> so, but, but I, I can, I can, I can uh, bear witness to, to the truth of what you said. Um, that 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 uh, you have a, a good whiskey collection and that you take it seriously. I do. Uh, I have an even better uh, one than last very, time you were here. Well, you're very generous in sharing it too. So um, oh, I appreciate I can, that. I can also also add that and a very gracious host. So well, um, thank you. I mean, I I believe. I Really strongly on the record if if if, <laughs> if i if if i said last week that you know i i'm very much upset with whiskey collectors because they drive up prices and they have no intention to actually drink the whiskey they buy it's just about mm. you know investing whiskey investors not collectors yeah. yeah um and i believe whiskey's for drinking but i also believe Absolutely. that whiskey's for sharing too it's an ex it's a mutual experience i if i lived alone and had no friends or no family or anything, I would never, I would probably never drink, honestly. It's just not something I enjoy doing without the, sh the shared experience. So when I'm like opening a new bottle of whiskey, I like to kind of like sit there with someone and talk about it and mm -hmm. say, this is what we got. It's it's kind of just like dull and boring when you're by yourself. So, well, um, I, I also have, the, have the, the British class issue that annoys the hell out of me about whiskey because, you know, whiskey is basically a working class poor man's drink. Yes. It was, it was the, the Scottish invented it to deal with waste beer from the beer industry. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you read Walter Scott, there's no record of any distilleries in Scotland. They're, they're really relatively recent. And, and, and it was for basically just the same as moonshine in Appalachia. Yeah. You know, uh, it was basically a, a similar um, process that, that, and so all of this sort of 
pretentious bullshit. Sorry. Um, uh, <laughs> no, it's bullshit. Uh, You're right. <laughs> uh, um, we can you know, swear on this show, Father. We can swear on this show. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Um, yeah, thank you for. I am uh, the only uh, censor, and me. I don't censor. So, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks for liberating Speak me. Speak your mind. Um, Speak your mind. <laughs> so, so I appreciate. It really good whiskey. And by the way, I'm not I'm not I'm not against people turning a profit. I'm a I'm a capitalist. I'm all for that. But um but the yeah, I don't like the um like you said, this they're not really collectors, they're whiskey investors. They're investors. Yeah, I shouldn't um, say collectors because uh, I'm a collector. And and it, and yeah. It, yeah, it undermines the the whole reason for making whiskey, which is to drink to and enjoy. to drink amongst friends, friends and, and yeah. you know, stories. I mean, and... whiskey itself means wa- water of life, right? Yeah. It does. It's yeah, an Irish word, aqua vitae. And right. So the whole yeah. idea is we're supposed to, yeah, uh, share life and 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 uh, whiskey to a certain degree helps that. It does. Yeah, past, it's, past it's... a certain point of drinking one, you know, a half a bottle to yourself, it, it doesn't help. That. They, they, call, they call it conversation <laughs> oil, Father. It's conversation oil. <laughs> that conversation right. oil. <laughs> Coming to us also live from the theological fantasy land of Tennessee, we have Brandon Milam. How are you doing tonight, Brandon? <laughs> Urban country. Urban country. <laughs> it's all dry though, Father. You can go out there and get no your you can go get your, your Jack Daniels, but you can't drink it. Because it's a dry freaking uh, yeah, county. Right. It's insane. It's all right. I thought it rained bourbon in Tennessee. Look, I like Tennessee, but it's a fantasy Ooh. land out there when it comes to religion. But anyway, let's keep going. <laughs> How are you doing tonight, Brandon? <laughs> I, I would have to agree with you on that. Uh, I guess my libation tonight is some cream soda. Okay. A and W though, that's a good, good choice. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, it's really good. Got like a 12 pack waiting for me. Mm. And weather wise here, I think I heard next week or so. I'm expecting lows in like the 40s or uh-huh. 50s. Heaven. Which means we're going to be right, right there right with, with you because yeah. we typically have almost the same climate. Um, so yeah, all, all the wasps and whatnot, they can just go ahead and die. That's I'm, what I'm I like them. about it. You know, you get rid of the mosquitoes top and everything. Off my fire firewood pile. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. So looking forward to that. Well, when he said wasps, I heard white Anglo-Saxon Protestants in my head. So I'm, I'm sure you did. I'm glad, <laughs> that you, I'm glad you qualified that. <laughs> Honestly, I think I think the cold weather gets rid of them too. So it's actually not a bad thing. You know. <laughs> No, they're from colder climes. They're all Norwegians. Well, yeah, but Scots. they all came down here to the, to the warm south. True. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but no, it's 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 um, the stories. You know, it, we, we had our um, we had some work here done this week, which is uh, what uh, actually ended up canceling mass because there was some changes in the schedule, and I, I had to be here, and I needed to get it done. Um, and you know, one of the workers came and, you know, it's, it's a nice guy. Look, nice guy, n- no complaints. We'll use the company again. So it's not really a problem, but, um, you know, he comes out and he, I don't know what it is. I mean, he didn't come in the house, so it's not like he could have seen stuff, right? He doesn't know me from squat and he just comes up to me outside and says, um, uh, Hey, I'm a Christian. Are you voting for Trump? I say, who the hell does that? You know, I mean, I'm like, literally, there was that's no a nice way to introduce, yeah, introduce yourself. I know. And that's basically I, how I it was. that line in the creed. Yeah. I missed that line wow. in the creed. I know, right? I mean, <laughs> and, it, and it's like, okay, first of all, where are we going with this? Why do you even need to know? Um, and uh, I, I think you could tell from my face that uh, the answer is probably no. And he goes, he goes, you don't like him? You don't like him? And I, I said, well, he's not libertarian enough for me. Um, and uh, I said, I wasn't really all that uh, uh, happy with the way he handled that vaccine thing. So his son steps up and says, it wasn't his fault. I said, well, actually it was. Operation Warp Speed was his idea. So uh, Br- uh, Biden actually took credit for it. And then I think he kind of backtracked after he realized that the vaccines weren't all that great. Really but unpopular. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But um, no, the vaccines and everything, that came from Trump. I hate to break it to those Trump fans out there, but uh, that was his idea. And the speed at which they were received, bypassing all the safety measures and everything else, that was him. Okay. I hate to say it. So I, I told him this and you could tell there was a little bit of tension there. He kind of calmed down, but I don't see what that has to do with being a Christian. Okay. Because, um, you know, that is the most ridiculous kind of association, but this is the way it is. So you he got to be in your box. Exactly. If and you're so in he this starts, box, then you got to be in this box. So he starts talking to me about, it. he goes, well, it's, 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 it's a war. There's a war on between good and evil. And he goes, he, he goes, you're going to be on the right side. And I said, that's exactly 
why I don't want to or would never even consider voting for somebody as divisive as Donald Trump outside of his policies. I don't care about his personality. I don't care about his personal life. It can suck. It can be, he could be a saint. I don't really care. That's not what I vote for. What I vote for is somebody who can actually manage the country well. And I don't think a divisive person is capable of doing that, even if they're really good. And yeah, maybe he's better than what we have now. That's something that could be talked about and there would be good arguments either way. But the fact of the matter is he's divisive. Biden is divisive. They're not qualified to run the country when you cannot manage both sides. You are the president of all Americans, not just your little group. Okay. And so kind of offended the, me. The, the, problem, the, the, the problem is, is that, that uh, political economics, that is because in political economics, the, the unit of currency is votes. Yeah. And what makes what makes for actually good economics, good for people, doesn't make for good for winning lots of votes. No. So unfortunately, I mean, I, I was asked to stand for Parliament here yeah. in New South Wales. Oh, I remember that. Uh, yeah, yeah, by, yeah. Yeah. And by one of the major parties. Um, so, you know, there was I would have had a 50 50 chance of being elected at least. And, um, you know, I said so. And I'm too libertarian for them, right? Yeah. I mean, I said, <laughs> that's what I was thinking when you told me about this. You know, I, I, <laughs> You're more so, libertarian than I am, and that's saying something. <laughs> I, I, I'm, bas I'm basically an, an extreme free marketer. Yeah. And so when, when people criticize capitalism, I join their criticism when they're talking about corporatism, because yeah. that is a problem. That's not, that's not well, a free a market. Difference. That's there's, a skewed market, too. It's so, so, yeah. um, so people on the right sometimes misunderstand me, too, although I am probably on the right. But, but this is the thing. This is the problem with, with, with um, uh, votes, is that so I, I stand, and, and I won't name the town, but let's say I go and stand in the, in the main town of this constituency, and I say, I want you to vote for me. If you vote for me, I will work my hardest to do as little as possible for you. So <laughs> yeah. it doesn't cost you any money. So you don't have to spend any more in tax than you need to. That we don't need a new shiny thing when the old thing works perfectly well. Uh, and that if you want to do that, you can do that with your own money that's freed up by the fact that I'm not spending it for you. You know. And then my opposition, who would have been in the Labour Party, will say, vote for me and I'll get a new swimming pool for the, for the town. <laughs> Who, right. and they'll vote for her yeah. yeah they'll vote for her yeah because they don't realize they're paying for it it's not like she's going to go and raid her piggy bank and pay for the swimming pool out of her own money she's going to spend your money to do it but you can't uh, you can tell people that and they will laugh and they'll like me but they won't vote for me i know i'm more irritated that this dude comes over to do you service and uh Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. You for Trump? yeah like bro you're here to like do this that or the other that's not your it business. was off-putting it was off-putting i would have told him was a, let's say it was a like a like a like a you know bleeding liberal i mean that could have really upset me i hope you're here to be a competent tradesman and if you don't right. do a good job you'll yeah. come back and, and he actually, that's what i hope and he did actually a, su a superb <laughs> job provide he, the services i asked okay, for good. and he, he did do a superb job but yeah. i mean it well, was then just i'd still employ him even if i didn't like his politics and, I, and, and this I, is how i view politicians yeah. this is how i view politicians too yeah you know like plumbers if you can fix my washing machine you're a good plumber i don't care about your moral um or ethical <laughs> position on things well it wasn't you even know, his uh, politics it's like you want to vote for trump look I'll, I'll, this is georgia there's a lot of people yeah, around yeah, here that love trump it. go for it <laughs> i have no problem with that but my thing is my thing is why did you have to preface it by hey i'm a christian are you voting for trump it's like right. what did the two have to do with anything and the, see that's the real problem because the reason christians are becoming so hated is they're being lumped into this political identity um, and, uh, you know, that is just See, outside of America, though, it's very different. Yeah. You know, in Britain and Australia, and I suspect in Canada as well, and, yeah. and all the other countries that have gone down the toilet because they think <laughs> socialism is great. Yeah. Um, uh, Christianity is associated with the, with the woke left. And social justice. You know why? So, you know yeah, why? Oh, so you're a Christian, so you're a social justice warrior. You know, it's that kind of thing. You know why? Because... Catholicism is 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 very very uh, uh, moderate. It is a lot of liberals. There's a lot of, but they're not the 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 extreme cons right wing is not typically Catholic, and I think some of the immediate offshoots into Protestantism, like Lutherans and um, Methodists, uh, they tend to be Anglicans. Anglicans as well. They tend to be 
also more in that moderate, almost slightly left. Um, and, and that's why the Northeast in this country is very liberal because it's very, it's all that Canadian, French Canadian Catholicism that sort of dominated the area. And, uh, it, 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 it continued on, which I have no problem with that. I'm, I'm not, you know, look, I have no problem with, with liberals. I have no problem with conservatives. Oh, what no, I have a problem I'm with just, is divisive. I'm just interested in it. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. People are free to oh, believe yeah. whatever they want to yeah. believe. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's but, what, um, I wouldn't be a libertarian I, I, if I didn't say that. And neither would you, yeah. you know, neither would you. <laughs> I just find it Interesting. And also that, um, I mean, again, Jordan Peterson says you can tell when you're not really speaking to a person, you're just speaking to an ideology. Mm-hmm. Um, that, That's that what this was what like I'm the other day. In is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and I'm just interested in unpicking that for people to yeah. say, you know, look, hey, there's perfect. There's lo- I'm sure there's lots of sensible reasons for you to want to vote, you know, left, right, centre, whatever. Whatever. Um, but but are they are they really reasons that you've thought about or, or, are, or are you kind of an avatar? for an idea yeah you know yeah. So, so for me it's just about are you a free thinker um whatever you conclusion you come to make sure you come to it deliberately you know rather than just um because you were told to believe uh, something yeah, yeah i mean I'll, i could go on but i won't i'll stop on i'm getting in the well, way well um, i'm sure brain is chopping at the bit to get to questions from the ether so we need to we need to give him his chance so <laughs> brandon what do you got for us tonight <laughs> So got a couple of questions that might actually complement this episode pretty well. Your sound, uh, the by the way, is fantastic. So I don't know what you're doing right okay, now, good. but keep doing it because it's great. <laughs> this is the best you've ever sounded on this show. It's the cream soda. I think so. Yeah, it, It's the cream soda. <laughs> uh, <laughs> He's been smoking so, cigars. <laughs> oh, there it is. That, that fixes all things. <laughs> so the first question yeah. comes from Marina. She says, hey, Bishop. I saw this novena for the souls in purgatory and noticed that it asks them to pray for us. I thought it was only the saints who could hear and petition our prayers to God, but I might be clearly mistaken. So can those in purgatory pray for us too? Okay. So it is, it is not standard. I would say it's an, it's a very unconventional, probably a made up prayer um, not something that would be an officially sanctioned prayer of the church mm. for there to be a prayer that would include uh, a line that asks the those in purgatory to pray for the living. Right. Um, and the reason for that is um, from a, I guess, theological vantage point. Uh, th- those in purgatory have enough to deal with. They don't need to be worried about the trivial issues of your living conditions when they are literally working out the, uh, the 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 purification process, which is at least from a theological standpoint, challenging, perhaps uncomfortable, um, and difficult. Yeah, their their dance cards full. And so it's kind of bad form, even though they are part of the church. It is the church, but they but it's the church suffering for a reason, right. because you know they they're in that state where um, purification is uncomfortable. Because think about it from. I can, I can kind of give those of you out there that might be confused as to what this is like. I can give you an analogy that will help you to understand. Pick five of the most precious things to you. Pick 10. If you've got 10 things, think of the most precious things you've got, whatever they are, whether they be things that give you safety or security, things that make you happy, um, things that have sentimental value. Think of any of it. And, then smash it to pieces, throw it in a fire, burn it, destroy it. That's some of the pain of purgatory because no attachments can come with you. None. Okay. So whatever is holding you back, that has to be released. That's usually very, very uncomfortable. Okay, that's an analogy. It's not going to be a perfect one. These are ineffable things. These are ineffable realities. And we're going to talk a little bit about these ineffable realities tonight. That's the subject of tonight's show. As you said, Brandon, it's a good lead in. Um, But typically, if we're talking just Catholic theology now, it is very bad form for the living to ask prayers for the those in purgatory. We should be praying for them. And that's ultimately what most of the sanctioned prayers of the church instruct us to do uh, rather than trying to burden them with, hey, why don't you pray for me too? This is not a reciprocal thing at this point. We are in a state to cultivate grace. They are not, okay? They don't 
necessarily need grace of salvation because remember, from a theological standpoint, um, those in purgatory are already saved. They're not going, they're not, they're not having to work out their salvation. That's our job. So that's why this realm, the realm of the living is known as the church militant because you have to fight for your, you have to work out and fight for your salvation. The purgatory is the church suffering because they understand the reality of God, but they can't have it yet. They're not able to enter into that reality. And then of course the church triumphant are those that have made it, right? Um, so that's the three stages of the church. And yes, we are obligated in a sense to pray for each other, regardless of what state of the church you're in, which is why pray, you know, asking saints to pray for you is part of Catholic tradition because they're part of the church too. And um, what better person to go to uh, for your prayers than someone that actually understands the nature of the divine better than you could ever on your best day. Uh, but the, but purgatory is a special kind of situation and, and, and we need to be giving them our grace to help them through those challenges, not putting our burdens on them. And let me tell you, compared to the trials of purgatory, the trials of the living are very trivial. Okay. Very unimportant. We really don't need to be burning. So this prayer that Marina has found is not an officially sanctioned Catholic prayer. Um, I think it's something that someone made up and wasn't, it wasn't checked by a bishop and it wasn't given the imprimatur to say this is a, uh, a, a, a valid prayer of the church. It's probably a lay person's prayer that someone made up and they didn't have the foresight or knowledge to understand how to write it correctly. Um, that's my guess. But, um, yeah, it's not that they can't pray for you or that they wouldn't. It's that we really need to be worried about them. They don't need to be worrying about us. Does that answer the question? Well, uh, there's, there's also the issue that um, why would we ask them to pray for us? We can ask the <laughs> saints to pray for us. I know. We got the saints, so, right? And, uh, yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't see the point for a start. What, what, the, what the church, the Catholic church has always taught, I mean, we, we can talk about orthodoxy as well. We have to talk about toll houses. Yeah. When the Orthodox claim that they don't believe in purgatory, mm, <laughs> sort of. They, do. um, they don't believe in they the. Do, really. They don't like the definition. They don't like the. They don't, and, they, and they don't like the economy of purgatory. Yes. Which, is, I, which I I think we all probably don't like either. Well, they like um, mysteries. But, they like they get, they, they they it's like they feel that I think in the West that we try to define things and. Yeah. And, and 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 create models that become like real life uh, and we risk examples. putting the boundary fence right through the heart of it yes <laughs> you know? um so but i think uh we what we do believe though is that is that um we should be praying for the souls holy souls in purgatory mm -hmm. you know that and that actually an awareness of the fact that we've got to be purgated purified to be in heaven mm. is what motivates us in life to 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 you know to 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 live a christian life and that we hope that when we go to be purified, people are praying for us as well. So mm -hmm. it's like, it, it, instead of seeing it as this sort of, you know, uh, fish hooks into purgatory, to, to borrow a <laughs> phrase, uh, throwing fish hooks into purgatory that they can somehow get us out of the mire, that, this is just a, a wrong way of looking at it, you know. Yeah. We throw them into heaven. Yeah. Um, that's where we want to be dragged to, you know. So, um, yeah, so I agree with you. I can't imagine that... that um, this would have come from a sort of over pious and slightly skewed, um, uh, overly religious lay person. I would think. Well, it comes back to I think even just looking at it from the metaphysics of of grace and how grace works on a theological, spiritual level and within Catholicism itself. Um, you know, we we cultivate grace. We have no on we have no grace on our own. There, we don't. We can't merit it. We can. We can receive it through the pure gift of God, which is predominantly given through the sacraments, uh, but it can also be given through prayer and spiritual exercises like reading scripture and things of that nature, dedication, dedication of one's life to God, that kind of thing builds grace. Um, um, and of course, those in the church um, triumphant are full of grace. They have the, they have the entirety of grace, so they don't need to cultivate it. They have all all in an infinite fountain of it. Um, we have access to the infinite fountain through the reception of the sacraments and, and, and pursuing those spiritual um, virtues. But per, those in purgatory, what they die with is what they've got. And we 
can give them more through our prayers. It's at least is how I try to help people to understand it. Of course, it doesn't really work exactly like this. It's just a way of trying to make the human mind wrap its head around it. Um, but they really, like Father Chris said, why would we need to even reach out or ask them for prayers when we have the saints. Let's give them our grace. They don't. You know, we, there's no grace for them to give us, but we have a, a plentitude to give them. Um, and so, yes, it is a. It is because very rarely would anybody die perfectly. Okay, I mean, unless you just really get lucky and you end up in, uh, you know, getting last rites and. You know, and 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 you die in that state of perfection. There's going to be that period of purification that most of us are going to have to work through. And if we have those attachments, they hold us back. Okay, they slow us down. And um, and this is where my Buddhism kind of comes in because, <laughs> as we talked about last week, and we're going to talk again next week about this as well. Um, I don't see the conflicts between Buddhism and Catholicism or Buddhism and Christianity. Um, it's really just understanding how they work together. Um, but the parts that are dark in Christianity are answered by Buddhism, and the parts in Buddhism that are dark are answered by Christianity. It's a beautiful symbiotic thing. We'll talk more about it next week, though. Um, but that's the answer, Brandon, I think. You know, it's, it's just bad form. At the very least, it's bad form. And at the very worst, it's completely... Uh, well, I mean, I guess at the very worst, it's bad form. At the very best, it's just completely unnecessary. There's just better things you could do with your prayer time. Yep. Right. Yeah. Like give the prayers to them. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. What's our next one? So the next one comes from me. Uh, like when I drive around, I have a lot of time to just think mm -hmm. and ask questions. Uh, so is heaven a place or a condition? I asked because I was taught that heaven was basically kind of like above us in the sky and there are people in heaven looking down on us. That comes from the Jewish um, model of the universe. It's Jewish cosmology that gave you, that gives that impression. And that was adopted into Christianity because it was the, the way people rationalize the spiritual realm. And um, the, it wasn't seen as outer space back then. It was seen as though there was a flat surface with a large dome and that when God opened up, there was a layer of, I guess you could say, water between uh, God's realm and our realm. And then when God opened up the doors, it would rain because all the water coming down from the heavens was because the doors were opened and the, that layer of water between the heavens and the earth would, would fall to the earth. Um, and so that was like part of Jewish cosmology that sort of became integrated into the Christian mind um, and sort of reinforced by the superstitions of, of the medieval period. Um, and that's where it kind of continues on to this day. The reality is, though, metaphysically speaking, there are there's no such thing as locations or places. They don't exist. There's 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 fields of energy that are consistent. And when we interact with those fields of energy that are consistent, then we can find them. And to us, we see that as places to go. But it is really just fields of energy. Um, so as far as whether or not somebody is in heaven, it is a condition, not a place, um, because there are no places. Everything is ultimately a condition, which is, again, very Buddhist of me because Buddhists don't think that nirvana is a location or samsara is a location. It's a condition that you're in. Um, I kind of see heaven and hell the same way. I know a lot of people that are living hell right now, um, and it will only, of course, permeate into a much more serious condition and as they die and lose their faculties of reason because the reason their their intellect is the only thing that can kind of pull them out of it when they lose that in death then they just got instinct and there's not much they can do at that point so yeah it truly does become an eternity of hell at that point but that's not a location they go to they're not being sent somewhere this is a condition that they adopt that they create around themselves that becomes a, a realm of experience energetically um but now that i i say this with the caveat the kingdom of heaven, as Christ understands it, will absolutely be a partially physical experience. Not at the end of time. At the end of time. Mm -hmm. Correct. At yeah. the end of time. It isn't there yet. Okay. From our vantage point, that 
physicality does not exist. This is why the resurrection of the dead is actually a physical thing. It's why it was so emphasized in the New Testament um, where Thomas St. Thomas puts his fingers through the nail marks. It was to show that, that we are not dealing with a ghost. Jesus wasn't an apparition. He was a, he w- it was the physical body and the same one that was on the cross. And th- this was to emphasize the nature of the resurrection. And so at the end of time, when all things are perfected and the, 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 the deficits of entropy fall away, um, and paradise is restored for lack of a better way of putting it that will be a partially physical it will be a perfect fusion between the incorporeal and and the corporeal the physical and the spiritual it'll be a perfect fusion they will coexist as one thing and there will again because truth and reality will be the same will be the same which at the moment they're not Correct. That's exactly. That we talked a lot about that last week, and we'll continue those thoughts next week too, because we're doing part two of psychic seduction next week. Okay, so you'll want to definitely catch that. If you saw the first one, you'll want to catch it. And if you haven't seen the first one, which was the the last week's episode, go back and watch the archive of it, so you're ready for it next week. Because we deal with this, and we're going to continue. We ran out of time, and we're going to get to more of your questions. Uh, we'll we'll definitely make that make time for that, but. We talked a lot about truth, the difference between truth and actuality. And, um, you know, so, yes, this is so is heaven going to be a place? Not yet. It will operate like a place when we reach that point in time. But right now, well, there's conditions. It, it's the same eschatological uh, issue mm. because in a, because all time is present to God and all eternity. Mm. It is already a place now, but we're not yet experiencing it. Well, yes, it. and I speak, so, that's exactly right. I'm speaking <laughs> from the human experience. I, what, yeah. what you said is absolutely right, yeah. you know, um, uh, obviously, but um, but it's also true to say it is a place. It's just not yet a place for us, for us. but it is a place. It is a place. Uh, and, so, uh, and also the Jewish cosmology, which, which you explain really well, there, uh, there is also something innate about, humans common to humans across cultures and across the planet that when we rate ra- we feel well we even use the term raising ourselves to the divine mm, yeah. and we look up to, to god yeah. now i don't know why that is but i know that it's common and so you know like you said it's an image of of how we view the heavens and the earth and that can that image can be taken too far mm-hmm. to think literally in that you know if we send a rocket we can go to heaven but um, well that's what you would have to uh, believe right if the Jewish yeah, cosmology was actually true, you could take a spaceship yeah. to heaven if you had one that could reach it. Well, I, I, <laughs> but I think I think there's an intrinsic truth to it that's not factual. Mm-hmm. You know, so so you know, a rocket won't get you to heaven. But yeah. there is that it's absolutely true that that we, we we want to raise our our hearts, our minds, our eyes. We say it in the Eucharistic prayer, "Lift up your heart." You know, um, the the Sursum Corda. There's something about looking up. Uh, and and really, it's about saying, well, God is God is beyond and above us. Well, I think uh, it's but, because but, we get to look yeah. into the infinite. It's the one thing yeah. in our experience as human beings where we can go out to the night sky and look up into outer space, and you're truly seeing the infinite. And there's nothing mm-hmm. else that we can do that with. Everything else. And has, you're looking back in time. And you're looking back. Well. In, you are. Yeah. So the you whole are. time and eternity thing is absolutely, yeah. you know, present. In, in that in in that act but it's like i said last week all right if we if we can say that god exists outside of time and the realm of god is heaven and if we go to join with him in this place that we call or this condition we call heaven um then if you're there if you if you make it to heaven then you've always been in heaven because heaven is outside of time and if something's outside of time that means Anything that's there that exists has always been and will always be, which means that if you make it, you're already there. You just don't realize it yet. That's, again, very, very... See, Buddhists understand this. You tell a Christian this, and they're like, what, 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 what? Now, you can talk to priests like Father Chris about this. You can talk to bishops like me, and, you know, we're always philosophizing. So we can we can get into these kind of deep things. But you go to, like, the if I were to try to tell the guy that, you know, said, hey, I'm a Christian, are you voting for Trump? If I were to tell him about this... He, he would look at me like I've got two heads, and yeah, I don't think, I don't think that would have gone too well. <laughs> he would have got that. Yeah. In all honesty, please, please come to 
where I live. Please come to some of the churches here and please start that conversation. I want to see that happen. I don't. Well, I think look, I'd be in, burned in, at the in stake. Fa- in, fairness, though, <laughs> in, 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 in fairness, though, that's why. That's why the ch- the church is a body, right? Yeah. You know, we're not all supposed to have the same function. Um, uh, we shouldn't desire that either. Yeah. And you know what? Um, you know, much as much as I can and do join in lampooning certain types of Christianity. I don't want to be too cynical about it yeah. because people are at um, their own level. Well, but also, you know, if somebody loves God, even move beyond Christianity, if somebody loves God and is seeking God with a, a sincere heart, mm-hmm. the emph- emphasis being on sincerity, yeah. then obviously we can laugh and joke on this show and there's no problem with that. Right. But, um, but dealing with a real person who, who, um, you know, they might be only hanging on to that faith by a thread. We don't want to, you know, come and smash it. No, that's you know true. what I mean? Like, no, that's, you make a good point. Um, well, I also believe that all of these different levels of Christianity do serve certain functions. You know, if yeah. if it is the only way a person is able to be introduced to Christ, well, there's not much harm in that. The harm in it, it comes to when it starts to become political or uh, you know, if it's being used uh, as a way to control or, or, or to promote ignorance or to, to create a proliferation mm-hmm. of ignorance, then it becomes harmful. Um, but you even see that at the higher levels. Look, there's a lot of Roman Catholics that I, I would say that it, all things being equal, okay, the one denomination of Christianity that has given me the most trouble for what I do on this show and in this church and everything else, the one denomination that gives me the most trouble is Roman Catholicism. Protestants have been far more gracious to me. So how can I criticize? I don't criticize the people. I criticize the methods. I criticize the 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 the, the, the um, degradation of theology. Yeah, I'm very critical of those things. Yeah, because I think that's about to use an analogy. You know, if 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 all the Christian can take is baby food, that's okay. Mm-hmm. If that baby food is all that their stomachs can handle, mm-hmm. then um, that baby food's fine. The problem comes when they say everyone else should only eat baby food. That's it. Right. That's, that's, that's where the problem is. And comes. that's why Protestantism so, is great. I'm fine with it. I don't really have any problem with it, but I draw the line at evangelical Christianity. That is a toxic mix. That is a toxic, toxic thing. And I don't. But it is better. It is better than secular atheism. Um, probably, but I think Satanism might be better than than than, 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 than evangelical Christianity. I'm not kidding. Secular atheism. <laughs> secular atheism, yeah, but Satanism <laughs> might actually have one. I did set a very low bar with secular atheism. <laughs> yeah, you did, yeah. you did. All right, uh, Brandon, what's our next one? <laughs> so the last question comes from Andrew. He asks: Is Islam a valid path to God? Is Muhammad genuine, and is the Quran sacred? Okay. Um, All right. So, (laughs) no. Um, Look, the answer to that is, uh, okay, first of all, the first thing I would say, and I think this is how I answered him when he asked it, is, um, is it valuable to you? Do you get value out of it? Great. Go for it. Um, But if you're asking me from a professional in the field of religion, what I think about this, I see two fundamental problems with Islam, okay? And these are the two things, the two barriers that would forever keep me from ever even considering it as a religion to practice for myself or, um, or, or really anybody, okay? And that is, number one, okay, it is a reactionary religion, and those are always false, all right? reactionary religions are always false religions and that is when you cannot exist on the on your own merits but rather can only borrow entirely from someone else's religion and then call it your own under a different name and make all these changes that's inherently fabricated okay that's a lie that's a that's a fiction and that's exactly what islam has done okay Unlike the relationship between Judaism and Christianity, Christianity does not discount anything in Judaism. All it, does, all it recognizes, the only difference is that we recognize Jesus as the Messiah and they, they missed it. 
we think they missed it. They think we missed it. Right. Okay. But inherently we believe pretty much the same as far as like we, everything yeah. in the old Testament is valid to us as Christians, yeah. other than th that, which Jesus of course, um, uh, fulfills of course. But again, you have to believe I that think, Jesus I Messiah. think we even believe that they can be saved through the first covenant. I think Absolutely. Well, now that now I think the catechism, the catechism has that. changed yeah. its view on that. It wasn't always so yeah. favorable towards Jews, but now the church has seen the error of its ways and it's changed that and for good. I mean, that's a good thing. So yes, that is exactly right. What father Chris said, there's no barrier to their salvation in Christian theology anymore. Um, or at least Catholic theology. So that's number one. Number one is they're fabricating. They're, whereas we see Judaism as completely true, and now we've got, we recognize Jesus is the Messiah that they're waiting for. The only difference is they don't see him as the one they're waiting for. They still think he's yet to come. And we say, no, he came 2,000 years ago. That's the difference. But we agree on everything else, okay? Fundamentally, of course, there's going to always be variations because Jesus changed things for the Christian. Now, Judah, Islam says, no, you guys both got it wrong and we're going to correct it for you. The apostles misled you. They wrote all this stuff. They didn't understand what Jesus was saying. Jesus never died on the cross. Jesus didn't, you know, there's no such thing as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This was all made up by people. We're, we've got the correction because God came down and through the angel Gabriel uh, dictated word for word the correction to Muhammad. And Muhammad wrote that down and that became the Quran. And this is the correction for the Jewish and Christian people. Um, okay. Uh, how pretentious of you to say that. But I mean, first of all, um, can you imagine a Christian said, no, Jews, you, you got it wrong. We're going to correct it for you. And that's not what Christianity does. Christianity sees itself as, as essentially, um, I mean, the Jewish people are our, our grandparents. I mean, that's, that's, that's how we see it. Islam saying that we're just all a bunch of heretics because we, we, we were, we were misled and it, it, it we changed things or the, you know, you know, the key people change things. And, um, that's inherently wrong. When you build a religion on that, you know, when you're going to tell the older religions, well, keep in mind, Judaism is like 4,000 years old. Christianity, okay, 2,000 years old. Islam, um, barely 1,500 years old. Okay, it's the newest one. It's the child trying to tell the parent and the grandfather that they don't know what the hell they're talking about. I have a problem with well, that. There's, an, the, the, there's another um, fundamental issue, which actually um, Jamie will relate to as a former cop, which is that, both Judaism and Christianity, and in fact uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, um, it's it, they're not authored by one person. Yeah. It's, it's the collective wisdom of many people mm -hmm. over a very long period of time. So that's why, as Christians, we would say, well, the unique thing about Christ, as opposed to Muhammad, is Christ is pre-announced. There's there's all sorts of predictions in, in uh, from the Old Testament prophets about his coming. Mm -hmm. right. Now. I know that I know that Jews don't believe that, but that doesn't change the fact that we do. Um, and well, it's so, just because they don't uh, see him as the Messiah, but they do agree that these are predictions for the Messiah. Yeah, yeah. And, and so you've got a, a collection of writings across time by many different people that assert that point towards um, the same truth. Um, now, many witnesses claiming the same event or the same. Um, uh, on the same line is much more compelling evidence in a courtroom than one person. So, uh, you know, I've heard, uh, I've got dear Muslim friends who say, oh, you know, but the Quran's the only complete religious book, you know, written from start to finish by one person. And I say, that's exactly why I don't believe it. Right. You know, yeah. that's the least compelling. That's uh, the least compelling thing. And they, that's yeah. the difference and, and then, is that we I'll just mention one more thing. Yeah. I'll just mention one more thing and then I'll shut up. Um, uh, if people want to understand the difference between the fundamental difference between Christianity in whatever guise and Islam in whatever guise, um, cause there's good and bad on both sides. It doesn't make you a good person being a Christian. Absolutely. It doesn't make you a bad person being a Muslim, but right. Muhammad entered Mecca, sorry, Christ entered Jerusalem, his holy city on a donkey. And uh, he was arrested, falsely arrested and tried and uh, allowed himself to be murdered. Muhammad entered Mecca with 10,000 armed men, besieged the city and conquered it. <laughs> That's the difference. 
Now, let's be clear. The Jews wanted the Messiah to do that. They did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They did. There they were expecting. The zealots that were hoping you'd They were that. hoping That's you'd right. come in and wipe out the, the Romans. But the, the, the reality is um, that we, while Christians refer to the scriptures as the word of God, we don't see it as the dictation of God. It is the, we, we fully recognize this as a collection of faith accounts by man as they interact with God. And through those inspirations, we get, we can extrapolate divine information. That's entirely different than what Islam, Islam believes about the Quran, which sees it as a literal dictation. This is what God actually said. Christians don't think that way about the scriptures. No, the Jews think that way about the scriptures. Uh, um, and it's not healthy to think that way about the scriptures. Um, but, you know, there's some evangelicals that actually do treat the Bible that way. And that's where it becomes very problematic. As we can see, that leads to fundamentalism. That leads to radicalization. Um, and it creates, of course, violence, because that's where a lot of religious violence starts from. So number one. Number one, the big, the first problem. I said there was two. The first one is that that um, you don't any religion that re requires uh, it's a full dependency on something older to exist is not a true religion. Number two um, is that it is absolutely a theocracy. Theocracies are political institutions. They're not religions. Okay. They're not religions. Um, and like you might say, okay, what about, what about the Vatican? I, I don't agree with what the Vatican did over those years. I don't agree with the theocracy. I think uh, I can understand where it came from because the mindset was different back then. And it's very, it's a very bad thing for modern eyes to judge the past. Okay. Yeah. Because we are not those people and we could not possibly understand what it's like to be those people. So we can't really put our morality on them. Okay. However, that being said, we now exist in a time where Judaism's moved on. Okay. Um, they may be, perhaps they would like us, someone in Judaism would like a theocracy again, but Israel's a secular place. Okay. Um, Christianity, we, I mean, Christianity, one of the most Christian nations, all right, um, up until recently, was the United States of America, and that was built on the, pr the principle of separation of church and state. Um, it was built on the idea and the spirit of religious freedom. All right, separation, okay? We never were, theocracy is a bad thing. So you could say, okay, I'll give you a pass, because in the ancient times, in, in feudalism, it made more sense. That was the, was the mindset, the the institution, the secular institution being operated by the king, the, the spiritual matters being operated by, you know, the church and then the two coming together. I get it. I get the whole thing. Okay, absolute monarchy. I get the whole thing with divine right. I, I get it. But we've moved on. We have a better way now and we're, we should be at least more advanced today. So for there to still be a modern religion like Islam, still trying to act like we're in the Middle Ages, that's problematic. And that, to me, is also a fundamental reason why I don't see any value in Islam. But this is my opinion. And I will tell you when I give you, an, when I give you a professional contention and when I give you a personal opinion. Right now, I am giving you a personal and, and opinion. Also, and also, you're very specific. We are talking about Islam, not Muslims. Correct. Yeah, I, if, if you find about the idea of, of this religion, not the people that follow correct, it. Correct, absolutely. Are people, the people are creating the image and likeness of God. And yeah. I would actually say that um, the kind of honesty and 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 um, sincerity that I have experienced in in Muslims has been far exceeded by my own Christian brothers and sisters. I'm, I'm that I've been backstabbed by them many times. Um, you know, when you go to a place that is... So is Christ. Well, I know, right? Isn't that the truth? But I mean... That's the deal. It, it is. But I, I guess I want to just emphasize, this is why I started out the answer to this question by saying, if you get intrinsically, if you get value out of the Quran, if you get value out of Islam, by all means, explore it. Um, and honestly, if, if you got to, if, if you get something, some kind of inspiration from it, why don't you explore the Sufis? Because they're a whole different animal than, 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 than fundamentalism 
fundamentalist uh, Sunnis and Shiites, you know, go to the Sufis. They're, they're persecuted. That tells you one thing. They must be doing something right. Nobody, nobody does anything right in religion and is not persecuted. So if you know there's a persecuted <laughs> sect, okay, then um, th th they're doing something right. So the Sufis are very persecuted by mainstream Islam. Um, that tells me they're doing something right. They're very mystical. They're not literalists. They would never be a terrorist. You will never see a Sufi terrorist. Just won't happen. Okay, it won't happen. You'll see them as protectors, though. Uh, what's that? You'll see them as protectors, Protectors, though. yeah, absolutely. So the Sufis clearly prove to me that there is value in in uh, some of the philosophy of, of, of the Quran and, and, and Islam itself. In fact, you know, a lot of Christians don't know this, but there's actually more about the Virgin Mary in the Quran than there is in the Bible. A lot more, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's, there's that element. Um, and we all come back as Abrahamic religions. The three of us, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, are all our our ultimate Godfather is is, a, is Abraham. So we are re related spiritually. Um, so I don't say these criticisms to the people, as Father Chris said. I want to reiterate that. I want to make that clear. I love Muslim people. They have been very kind to me with very few exceptions. Okay, very few exceptions. It's only the real political types that have a problem with me. And it's really not my Christianity that they have a problem with. It's... Um, it's the fact that I'm just a, I'm a liber I'm a I'm a I'm a unapologetic libertarian, and uh, th theocracy is the furthest thing from from that. Um, yeah, and they 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 can't handle that. They they, they it's it's very authoritative, and I can't be that way, and I can't be that way with well, religion. We, we we would oppose theocracy even if we were the theocrat. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I would. I mean, if 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 the church tried to reestablish the power it had in the Middle Ages, um. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd go all Martin Luther on their ass. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would. <laughs> I really would. Um, but, you know, that's, that's, that's just the way it is. Um, any, does that answer all the questions, Brandon? Is that all of them for tonight? Seems like it's answered all the questions. All right, great. So let's go ahead and take our break here, our first one. When we come back, we got Reagan Forrest and don't go <laughs> we'll away. Stop. I know, right? Yeah. I know. Can't wait. Don't go away. You know where they hide mm. Your love's a little heavy You're touching me already And it's working up my nerves You should probably forget me Cause I'm terrified you'll get me When I'm at my worst It's not too late to let you know That you're in love with a ghost So Run!
Welcome back, everybody, to Vestiges After Dark. We're getting ready here to start tonight's topic as we journey into the afterlife with our special guest and um, been on the show several times, Regan Forston. We're always so excited, and he, I think he is our most popular guest to date as far as uh, all of the, if you look at all the stats of all the guests we've had, um, his are the most popular. So um, we're so blessed to have him with us. You don't want to miss it. Don't go away. see in the chat room there riverboat gambler i want to do a oh, yeah. uh, little plug for him i do it every now and then at least once a season um if you enjoy gambling if you enjoy las vegas if it's something that you have fun with um the best thing that you could possibly do for yourself before you even go is to get yourself familiar with all of the games that you could encounter out there or even to any casino really um by playing in a safe way where you can't lose any money because the casinos are counting on you not being very skilled at the games and so this is a way to get yourself prepared and he has this fantastic app that i discovered a few years ago and loved it so much and i start i, I eventually started sending him suggestions so a lot of the games in there are because of me but <laughs> he even mentions me in some of the descriptions of the games on the app so look for it it's kind of funny um but uh he he's very responsive as a developer uh he kind of understands what the player wants and needs and he does a very meticulous job with making the game as perfect as possible particularly with the mathematics one of the biggest problems i've found over the years with uh, casino video games is that they didn't really do a great job working the math out so there's a lot of bugs when you play the game it's like you know blackjacks aren't playing what they should pay and all that stuff um and so riverboat gambler uh on uh, iphone or um uh, android you can find it on the app store has uh, that's the app and it's uh, riverboats in the chat right now and it's his game that he developed um is is brilliant and if there is a mistake that's found because i mean it's complex math there's a lot of stuff that goes into it um he corrects it very quickly you know he's always updating it there's always a new game coming out um so it's a wonderful way like one of the things that i love to play now is pie gow tiles it's a kind of an obscure game a lot of westerners don't know how to play it it's mostly a chinese game it's my favorite casino game of all time but i was always too intimidated to go up to the table and interrupt a game it wasn't really so much intimidation it was like i didn't want to bother people with my ignorance and uh, buying a book on it really wasn't very helpful but Riverboat Gambler put this out there in his app. I mean, that wasn't because of me. That was already in the game or somebody else asked for it and he put it in the game, I think. Um, and I became a very good player of Pygo Tiles now. Now it's like I, I love it because I always win. Um, so I very rarely ever walk out of a casino without at least five or $600 more than I walked in with. And it's because of Pygo Tiles, as long as they have that game there. Not a lot of them have that game, but... I think Harris in Las Vegas does, and um, I can thank Riverboat Gambler for that. So I guess I owe you a commission or something, Riverboat. 
<laughs> but thank you so much good for plug, that wonderful plug. game. Yeah, it's a wonderful game, and I like to mention it every every season at least once. Okay, so tonight we're talking about the afterlife, which is kind of the theme this season so far. And if I was looking at all of the upcoming episodes, and uh, it is a continuing theme, uh, talking about the afterlife and afterlife experiences and near-death experiences. Regan Forston has been on the show several times before to talk about all different types of metaphysical topics, but one of his areas of expertise is really in the study of what happens to us after we die. So tonight he's going to bring us up to date with some new insights that he has for us and uh, the seven uh, or six layers of heaven, six plate uh, or dynamics within heaven that he will discuss and um, whatever else might be on his mind. And of, of course, taking your questions in the third hour. So let's welcome Regan Forston to the show. How you doing tonight, Regan? Good so you, good Regan. to see you. I just love you guys. I, it's funny. I can't tell you how many times I've been on other podcasts and I always mention you guys. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> well, thank you. That's I don't know. You just, um, there's something about all of you. And now with uh, Brandon now being here the last couple of times, it's just a good group of good people, you know, and we're, we're all here for the same thing. It's like, we're all curious about what the heck is this? What is life? Where what, is you know, figure it all out. what the hell are we doing here? <laughs> I know, and it's like, oh my God. And the more I do this work, I mean, it's so funny because we get a lot of questions answered, which are, which I'll mention some new things tonight. Um, but, once that question is answered, there's always another one that pops up that yeah. you haven't thought of before. Yeah. So it's confusing. It's like there's never, it's not like a book where, okay, get these 1,000 questions answered. We got everything. You know, it's uh, it's there. Uh, the thing that really stuck out to me recently, you know, a new telescope that we put up out, out there now, and how before this new telescope, they could see that at least universes went like 9 billion light years away. Who could who could even comprehend going at the speed of light for 9 billion years I mean, to get yeah. to the farthest star? <laughs> well, know. now, because of this new telescope, it's 27 billion light years. I mean, that's like, in other words, the whatever God created here is gone, is three times as big now as it was a, a little bit ago. And who's to say what the next telescope will bring? You know, so how can we as human beings even understand infinity, you know, and yeah. all this stuff? Uh, but I will tell you one thing, a lot of my clients, well, just so the people haven't seen me on here before, I'm a facilitator with the Newton Institute, and there's 250 of us trained now. We're in 46 countries. We do eight different languages, and we're carrying on the work that was just, uh, accidentally discovered uh, way back in the 90s by uh, Michael Newton. Um, he had a client that was, uh, he was, he was a hypnotherapist, and he had them in trance because he was trying to help them. It was either like quit smoking or lose weight, you know, one of those bread and butter things that hypnotherapists do. And so it was time for him to bring the person out of trance. So he says, okay, I'm going to count from one up to five and you'll be totally back. And and the client says, no, <laughs> no, I'm not coming out of trance. What do you mean? No. <laughs> yeah. and, and Dr. Newton says, well, wait a minute. Why? And he says, I, I want to go home and see my friends, you know, and he goes, well, wait, I'm going to wake you up. You're going to go home and see your friends. And the guy says, no, I want to go see my friends. Well, instantly, all of a sudden this guy's, talking like he's at a big party and he's talking to all these different people and he, and it, long story short that they were people in the afterlife you know and uh dr newton just happened to be the perfect person for this to happen because of his inquisitiveness his 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 ability to research so he proceeded to find a way and he had seven thousand people over his uh, lifetime that he was able to have this experience where they had like a it's like a near death experience without the death part. Okay. In yeah. other words, found a way to activate this. And because um, these sessions are about 90% successful, um, what we in the research we've done, we're thinking we all have this ability. You know, it's just that we just now found a way to access this process. And um, so all we do, you know, we say hypnosis, we say trance. All this is really is a person becoming very relaxed. And all we do is we go through the process of falling asleep. So they're listening to me and I'm just suggesting to them that they're feeling the tension that's in their head and their shoulders. And one, two, three, you can just feel that tension leaving your body. And it's, 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 and this is what happens when you go to sleep. You don't just hit a switch like a, an on off switch and boom, you're out. There's a process of falling asleep. So um, hit the bottom of the breath and notice this tonight as you're going to sleep, it's like a step down process mm -hmm. where you just go, 
a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, boom. Then you were, next thing you know, it's morning. It's at the bottom of the breath um, when the body is completely relaxed because no muscles are moving or anything, right? You get to the very bottom and it's like peace and calm. Your body is just beginning to downregulate, you know, right? At the bottom. And so every time you get to the bottom of the breath, you go another step down and another step down, another step down. So all my clients are doing is I'm helping them to uh, fall asleep on cue, you know? So uh, scientifically, because I'm that kind of person, I always, I'm like a doubting Thomas my whole life, you know, I want to stick that finger in there, you know, <laughs> you see what's going on, you know, prove something to me. Yeah. Well, what we found out is when, when machines are hooked up to you, it's right is theta waves. And people know we like right now we're, we're in um, uh, alpha. No, we're in uh, beta. And as you begin to relax, you go to alpha and then there's theta and then there's delta. Mm -hmm. And they can measure brain waves that way. Well, when the theta waves start coming in, right in that point there, when you're just about to fall asleep, because I'm communicating with people, they stay in that state so they don't fall asleep. And that seems to be where the magic happens. But think about it this way. Uh, if you talk to some of the, through history, the people that have invented things, that have come up with ideas and everything, uh, that have had visions and things, it's when they're in a deep meditative state, like someone who's really praying, you know, somebody who's meditating or praying, and they get into that state, and all of a sudden, they, they're able to see a bigger picture of things. They can see more, like if they're having a problem, all of a sudden, an idea will come to them, but when the waking state, they were too narrow. But when you open that up a little bit, then all these ideas come. There's a, a, a talk about, like, I think it was uh, Edison who had, like, what, a thousand different inventions he did uh, or something. Um, he found a way be, because he would try to get himself into this really meditative state, and he'd always fall asleep. So he used to lay there, and he put a handful of marbles in one of his hands so that if he started to fall asleep, his hand would tip and the marble would hit the floor, and he could keep keep him in that, you know, creative state that Stay way. Stay in that, that halfway zone. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. people like when you read about the story about the saints, like um, a good a good um, uh, one for Christians to read is the uh, the writings of uh, Saint Teresa of Avila. Uh, her writings are are in books, you know, because she wrote a lot of things. She was back at the time of the Inquisition, and luckily that she had friends in high places because she otherwise these things she was saying she would have been a heretic and had her head cut off and and killed like a lot of the people in the Inquisition. But um, what was funny is that her writings, the the head, the higher ups would secretly read her writings all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, like St. John of the Cross was the same same way. He was a, a contemporary of hers. And what what she would do, she would go into deep prayer and she would find herself in the presence of Jesus. In other words, she would be have, have like an out of body experience She'd before Jesus. And in her book, she talks about says, OK, Jesus, what's my next thing? What's what I got to do? And he would say, OK, Teresa. In the northern part of Spain, in this part right here now, they really need to have a nunnery started up here. And Teresa would say, ain't no way, Jesus. There's no way. There's too much <laughs> politics going on. At that time, monks were warring with each other and killing each other. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. their disagreements and theology and different things. So, but Jesus would say, nope, that's what you got to do. And lo and behold, doors would open. Things would happen. She'd get a nunnery started in that part. And he would go, she would go back again, you know, like she was really connected to Jesus that yeah, way. Yeah. And that's all this kind of is. It's just allowing the average person who has an open heart and they're just saying to God, say, look, I just want a bigger, I just want to know some more. I want some more pieces to that giant puzzle that I can't see, you know? So um, what I have people do is write a list of questions beforehand that they want to have answered when they're on the other side. And it's generally questions about their life. They want to realize, they want to say, okay, why did I decide to be born? Why did you put me down here? What am I supposed to do to help humanity? You know, what's my goal? What's my mission? What do I hope to learn? What do I hope to teach other people in this life? So they get, they're always, they get super clarity on that. And um, most people find out that they're right in the middle of their mission, you know, because somehow or another you've subconsciously or something known like all of us here, like Chris, you know, the, what you guys are doing right now, even with this podcast is a way of expanding people's awareness to things, you know, so that they have more, you know, they can accept or not accept what they hear. But the more you hear, you're going to find, you're going to accept certain things and you go, Oh my God, that's so true. You know, yeah. kind of thing. Uh, so um, in the hundreds of cases I've done now, I, I'm, I'm getting to like it more and more and more all the time. Um, you know, I was on coast to coast recently, so oh, really? I had, cool. yeah, I had, oh my gosh, 
I had like 4,000 people hit my website overnight. I, I bet. Yeah. yeah that's, like, that's a big show. Yeah. You know, I had pages went flying everywhere. I had to have it all redone and everything, but um, there's such a, there's in, in, and I think too, like e- even Catholicism is having a renewal now with a lot of younger people. You know, I think that because um, especially I think of people like you guys here that have more, more of a, um, you know, not an old fogey kind of approach to church, but <laughs> like, Hey, let's, let's really dig into this thing and let's really go deep and find some more answers to things, you know, that way. So um, as you guys were talking, I wrote down a bunch of stuff here and I'm trying to think in, in, in the research that that us uh, we've done with 70,000 people. Now um, the things you were talking about, like what things are, are kind of, you know, like what you're saying, or we found out to be true. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we found out to be true is this thing called purgatory. Um, really? So you have you have people coming back and reporting purgatory. Well, here's what it is. We we just call it time out. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. essentially. That's pretty true. I mean, yeah. That's it's like a description. It is. I love it. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's a little corner that you put, you know, you put the two-year-old in for a while. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, that's what I think of it is that way. But these are souls that get to the other side and they've screwed up their incarnation so bad down here. Like they, they had plans of what they wanted to do and what they learned, but they got seduced by, you know, whatever people get seduced down here and they got off track. And once they left their body and they died, they got the other side. I'm, I'm just to give you a picture of what's in my mind. They get the other side and they go, you know, Oh, what did I do? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. my God, I went down there with good intentions. I was going to do this and that. And look what happened. You know, I got all sidetracked and I screwed up. I did a lot of bad things. And sometimes it's so bad what they've done that when they're before the council and everything and they're getting their review in a sense, and they screwed it up so bad that they decide themselves to put themselves in time out. They say, look, I am so far gone here from what I could have been. And I'm so damaged from going down there and back. I need, uh, what I need to do is I need to put myself in a way so that I can, I can really get back to the essentials of things and I can get myself on the right foot and when we ask sometimes, like, well, how long would that be? They say, well, Earth years, a couple hundred years, 500 years. I mean, you know, because there's no time and space. But if we want to think of it as something, you know, it could be a long period of time that they go back for um, reflection, for them to, like, restore the energy of their souls and everything before they decide to, you know, come back and give it another try. Um, now, this thing about, you know, reincarnation, I found a way to – because we, what we're just trying to find out in this thing, if you look at it when people say, have we lived many lives and everything? Well, we found out all these 70,000 people experienced a past life before they went to the afterlife in the process we do. Um, but when you realize that we're created, we're not created here, we're created in heaven. You know, that's where we found out in the research that, you know, God created us in heaven. In the Bible, there's a thing that says, uh, in the womb, I already know you or already knew you or yeah, something right, like that. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, that's where we're thinking. Pardon? Is that? Oh, you got it. Okay. That's great. So, and what I'm finding out is when people, because sometimes when people have this experience, they don't even go to a past life when they get to the state. I've had a couple people recently and they find themselves back at the source and they're, they're like the best way I can describe it. Cause I'm, I'm getting this through the picture they're giving me, mm-hmm. you know, cause I haven't had that experience when I went there twice, but they have, they feel like they're in a, in a giant sun is all they can say. It says, I feel like when the, there's so much energy, there's, but, but the energy is love. Mm-hmm. Think of how the sun is firing. Imagine if that's love, right. You know, how powerful that would be. And they're at a place of peace. They can feel that they're one of gazillion, you know, I mean, like they're like, like they're, they're in the soup of other souls in this, in this, whatever God is in this thing. And it was so interesting in a, in a, a, a case I had recently, um, I was with her for 10 hours. I mean, this was so wow. amazing. And because her life was so, it was so much like this, that there was so much to unwind and so many questions she had and so much work she had to do on the other side. But she just found herself. And when she's experiencing it, I guess it was kind of maybe a little bit like Nirvana or a little bit like, you know, where you're just soul, you're just this pure spirit and you feel love like, like you can't even express in human terms. You know, it's just right. so great. Right. And so she's in trance and she goes, she goes, oh, just I'm burning up. I'm burning up. You can feel my forehead, feel my hand because I'm burning up. 
it, 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 and I would touch her. She's as cool as a cucumber, and I touch her hands, nothing. Well, um, the next day, she emailed me. She goes, Regan, I says, I woke up, and I'm sunburned. Her face was sunburned. Her hands were sunburned. She had to put lotion all over it. Oh, wow. So, so interesting on how that was, that energy was so much that yeah. it, you know, was that, that actually way. had a somatic effect. Yeah. Yeah. In that, yeah. In yeah. that state, though, in that state, all of the problems, which she had many, 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 uh, very difficult life she had. She had this feeling of total. She was saying when she was in that state, she says, I don't ever want to leave here. She says, I have no problems. I feel totally, you know, at one, you know, with the universe. And that was kind of unusual, but that was a, I mean, that was a case I remember because that was so, you know, so unusual. Um, When people screw up a lot and they say, well, it's, you know, I'm not ready to do anything else right now. I need to be in a timeout. I need to, I need to really get in there and really reflect. And I really need to get myself ready to, you know, come out and then, and then, you know, kind of be in the process again. So it's just a different way of looking at it, but I find it pretty similar, you know, that way. Well, that, that's like the, that's like the vision that Job had, you know, that the, the, you know, all these terrible things happen to him, and people say, "Well, you must oh have gosh, upset, yeah, you've upset God." But actually, that we know from the start that's not true. That we know that he's he's considered righteous, and that really the answer is very unsatisfying to us as the reader, <laughs> because. The answer is that that God reveals uh, uh, part of who He is to Job, and that is the sufficient answer. And that's kind—I of, think—that's very similar to what you just described. You've got all these problems, but then one um, glimpse at the beatific vision, which is, you know, I suppose that's very Catholic terminology, but but one glimpse at, at the revelation of of the good, the innate goodness of God, is sufficient to. Um, to raise you beyond those problems, I think yeah, it doesn't it doesn't doesn't it doesn't eradicate problems. It says there's something greater than those problems, which is love. Yes, and matter of fact, when you say why do bad things happen to good people? You know, if God's so good, well, look what happened to Job and the outcome mm-hmm. of that. I mean, you know, um, so many times people have told me because I deal with a lot of people that come to me have a very high spiritual background. And, and there's this theme that seems to happen that it, that when a person reaches a new stage of awareness, you know, like they're able to handle more of the light and more of that, um, a lot of times their lives, as they know it, completely fall apart. I mean, where they lose everything. It's almost like you have to lose everything to gain everything, you know, which is another theme of the Bible, right? You know, so in other words, um, when you're seeking God, it's um, sometimes uh, it can cause it. But but the way I explain it to people is like, okay, because I have to have a way to explain it so I can understand it a simple way. I picture like you're working in a corporation and you start on the bottom floor, you know, it's this big high rise and you're, you're in the mail room, you know, and every day you're sending up the mail, everything and you do pretty good. And pretty soon they go, Hey, you know, you make a pretty good guy in human resources. That's on floor number three. So you go to there. Okay. Let's say if it's 10 floors high and pretty soon you're up to the ninth floor, and then you get a pink slip and says, hey, you know, we want you to come up to the top floor. Well, you've you've never seen anybody on the top floor before because they're just out of reach. You know, these are the head guys or something. And the thing is, and you, and you get that pink slip and you want to get to that top floor because that's your goal. But then you look around and you go, I'm going to lose all my friends here on the ninth floor. You know, oh, gosh, I'm not going to see them again. And I'm going to it's going to be painful in that. But here you go, getting in that elevator on Monday morning, going up to the 10th floor, because you know that you want you want that top floor, you know, which we're all seeking, you know, we we, we want that. And so that means that um, the old you doesn't fit anymore. You know, in other words, when you have an, it's like the clothes don't fit anymore because now you got to wear on the top floor. Everybody wears these brooks suits or something you know whereas before you could come to you know on the in the mail room they didn't care if you even came naked <laughs> you, just, <laughs> you, just come, you just show up you know yeah. uh, so that's the way it, it kind of seems nice, in this man. work that i'm doing <laughs> So <laughs> I was going to say, Bishop Brian's very happy with naked. Yeah, this, so I, I think that would be uh, really good. <laughs> He's done a whole show on it. I have. Clothing's yeah. kind of like a, uh, it's a it's curse. It's a curse. The yeah, curse of Adam and Eve. He's show naked, just to clarify. <laughs> no, he's <Yeah>. not. <laughs> she won't let it happen. No, he's not. I'm not sure YouTube would let it happen. <laughs> Here's what's interesting I found out. You know, when you were talking about the Sufis, now, um, I, you guys out there, because you've studied so many things, you're probably far ahead of me in this thing, but a, a, something from a layman's standpoint of someone who's just curious about things, 
It was interesting. I was noticing that it seems like every major religion has its followers that are more in the physical, and they have the followers that somehow have found a metaphysical part of that particular truth. Um, the, the thing I was thinking with Christians, it seems it was the Gnostics. You know, yeah. like um, I remember reading about um, uh, when the Gnostics were having. It was in the around the time when they decided what books were going to be in the Bible and everything. And the Gnostics were having a session, and a bishop comes in and chewing them out, like saying, "How can you be having a service? You have to have a bishop here, right? You have to have a bishop here to tell you what to do." And the Gnostics, and, they, and, and, the, and the guy says to the Gnostics, "Well, how do you? Who's running this thing?" And the Gnostic says, well, we just draw straws. You know, when people comes in, you know, who's got the longest straw there, they get to be the leader for today, you know. And uh, and so they believed more in a, in a metaphysical side to Jesus, you know. And, uh, and the Sufis, they're the – when I had a talk with um, – I had a booth uh, – I used to do handwriting analysis, as you know, because I'm doing oh, the show. Oh, that was a great right. show, yeah. That was, that was so much fun, by the way. It was. I, it was great. I, now, Chris, I got your, you sent one, right? Didn't yeah, you? Yeah, you replied. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that was really fun. So <laughs> my booth was set up, and they had um, a Muslims there, and they had a big picture of Jesus. That was the first time I realized that they believe that Jesus is coming again, too, but that the followers of Muslims are going to be the ones that he's looking for. And the other ones are going through the trap door to hell, you know, <laughs> because they said that, you know, Jesus is a prophet and he's coming back again. I didn't yeah. even realize that connection. Yeah. So um, they tried to convert me. And, you know, when I said, well, it's, it's just not a cup of tea. And they all looked at each other and says, okay, we've done our job. We've gave him his choice. He refused. That's all we have to do. Mm-hmm. You know, it was kind no, of, you down. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was interesting just to watch them and how devout they were and I had great conversations. I mean, it's their, it's just their walk, you know, um, that they had there. But, um, and I forget why I was going with this. Where was I going with this guys? Well, you, you, were talking, you were talking about the, the, those with the, with the metaphysical side to religion. Oh, I, yeah. I'll just, and I'll so, just offer a, a, a quick, a quick clarification on that though. I mean, yes, the Gnostics were, were obsessed with uh, the spiritual metaphysical realm to the exclusion of the physical realm. So that, that was why oh. that was, that was too far the other way. So, but I think there is a contemporary example with, within the church, which, you know, Mount Athos, uh, the Holy mountain in Greece, where uh, orth- Orthodox mon- monasteries are. Um, if you, I've met many, I'm very fortunate. I've met many monks from that have lived on Mount Athos. Um, and they will talk about, you know, they blend speaking it. with the, yeah, they talk about speaking with the saints exactly like you and I speak. In fact, more intimate than you and I speaking now in the same room. Um, wow. So, you know, but it, 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 they have to go to this place where there is that, um, just tying in with what you said, because it really fired me off. I always get fired up by you. You're great. Um, <laughs> but the the, um, uh, the, uh, the the idea that, in fact, you've got to shift um, your own emotional mental state you know, to, uh, so that they have very much a slowed down life, that they spend hours in their cell, that they, you know, and it sounds like, you know, those sorts of precursors are what, are what you were describing. So well, no, like no, I encourage you no to read, read some, of them, some, yeah. some of the monks from Mount Athos, right. they write, and, and I think you'd enjoy what they write. The, the key yeah. is the lack oh, of I mean, attachment, I think, is that we are so distracted yeah. by the the energy of the modern world everything and, and everything uh-huh. is a distraction everything is a worry everything is a fear response um so when you can go to an environment that literally takes all of that away then now you're free to actually be a little bit closer to who you really are and you can taste authenticity um and i think that's what happens at places like mount athos and uh in a more, I guess, laboratory setting with what Regan's talking about here with using techniques like hypnosis or different types of techniques that can sort of uh, create that same response where you're taking away those distractions. So again, it comes back to no attachments. And the Buddhists were right. You know, you, you, the attachments are what are what cripple us. They're what hold us back. And um, imagine if you didn't have any of them, what would there be? Well, as soon as, and that's what Buddhism is trying to do is once you strip away all the layers of the onion of, 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 of delusion, then what you arrive at is the emptiness of authenticity. And that's where reality really is. That's the, the, that's the, uh, the, the essence of all things. I think all of the spirituality that we're talking about here are different layers of the onion. 
you know? So it's all like we've talked about father. It's all true. Um, but I think what we're really trying to get to a living or dead, you know, regardless of what state or condition we might be in, where our awareness happens to be, we're all working towards authenticity, however we can find it. And so there's the different worldviews that have different ways of getting there. Some are more efficient than others. Um, but I think that's ultimately what all of this is about. Do you agree with that, Regan, in, in your research? I do. Yeah. And, and it's like um, I've been on a number of uh, re- spiritual retreats or quests in a way. One of them was at a Buddhist monastery where we did um, nine hours of open-eyed meditation every day for eight days. Uh, the hardest thing I ever did. <laughs> really? How many hours? How many hours was it? A day? Nine hours a day. Nine hour days, yeah. Well, what we did is we we would do um, uh, like a half hour, 45 minutes, open-eyed meditation, and then we'd get up. We had to take our shoes off, and we walked barefoot in the snow around for half an hour, barefoot in the snow around this thing meditating. Then we would come back in and sit and do some more more open-eyed meditation. It was like a – and then we would do – uh, we would do a walking meditation within this pl- sacred space that we made. And then we'd be out, you know, so you know, we mixed it up a little bit, but the, the thing that taught me about meditation then, because everybody thinks if they're going to meditate that they got to sit down, have their hands a certain way right, and still. be there for an hour or two or for months, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they go in this busy world, they can't do it. And what I found out and what they told me from the other side is it doesn't matter. He says, look, if you want to do one or two minutes just to connect your side to heaven, just to acknowledge that you have work to do today to make the world a better place. Just do it for one or two minutes. He says, you could be sitting on the John in the morning, close your eyes and do, you know, get two things done at once. Yeah, you know? sure. it's, just, it's, just, <laughs> it's just this connecting. They want you to acknowledge when you wake up that you're these spiritual beings and you've got a work to do. And so the, the, the prayer that I got when I was coming back my first time from the other side and the prayer that I heard in my, in my mind with a guide standing there, um, was, um, and I think this would be good for anybody, as you wake up in the morning, it's uh, bless this day and those that I serve as I keep one foot in heaven and one foot planted firmly on earth to accomplish my mission. You know, so it starts you out in a good thing saying, okay, I'm a vehicle for good today, you know. Um, and then, um, and the second thing, of course, he told me to do was, um, and that's to do this work, to keep myself so that my physical body, and he said, <clears throat> He, uh, again, he, um, my guide up there says, are you sure, Regan, that you want to come down and do this work? And I, and I, I, scre- I at least it felt like I, in whatever I did in whatever body I'm in there, I screamed, yes, you know, I want to <laughs> do this work. You know? And then I found myself getting a little closer. I was above the earth, actually, because we were talking about where heaven is or something. Well, wherever this experience happened, it was like it was like earth is the school and they lifted me out from the school for a minute, you know, to show me a bigger thing rather than just the school that I'm in. Mm -hmm. And as I started getting a little closer to earth, I, here I am in trance and I'm starting to feel and cry. I'm getting all this emotional pain. And my guide stopped me. He says, Oh, hold on a minute. He says, Regan, if you're going to do this work, which you said you really, really want to do, the physical body can only handle so much energy at a time, whether it's good or bad. You know, we just, we have this capacity, like, you know, too much electricity and we're electrocuted. Right. But, you know, uh, a, a little bit, and you know, <laughs> I just had one of my well, clients. No electricity, and we're dead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's right. That, that new process for you know, what, they're, what they're doing is you know electrocuting the brain for two weeks oh, a yeah. bit at the time. You know, the shock therapy. So um, he said, you got to do four things. You got to wake up with this prayer. Got to do that. You got to spend more time in nature because he said God's the beauty of the God's created down here and everything, just walking within it, it begins to heal you. It begins to, it begins to relax you it begins, you know, it's a good thing. He said, do as many random acts of kindness as you can. And in my mind, I saw myself picking up a piece of trash that wasn't mine from a Seven Eleven store in my mind. I saw, and I put it in a, I put it in a little trash thing. And um, then the fourth thing he says is common sense thing is to talk to other therapists and stuff because they're listening to people's problems all day and have all this energy. How do they find, how do they um, balance themselves? Okay. Um, So um, they've told me that like even doing these sessions, not to do too many at once. And uh, a couple of weeks ago after coast to coast, I did eight in one week. And I swear after the eighth session, I got in my car because I went to their, I, I went to a place in Palm Springs and I, I did a session for the, the wife one day, the husband the next day, and a friend of theirs came in from LA, drove a hundred miles. And I did two sessions in one day. 
It was wonderful. It was a beautiful experience. It was a lot of emotion, a lot of healing that went on. They got so many answers to their things. But when I got in my car to drive, I couldn't tell what was right from left. I mean, yeah. I yeah. just, I, it started scaring me a little bit. Yeah. And I'm going, oh my God, this is what they're talking about. So I just did my GPS, even with the G, and then my GPS starts sending me, it's weird. I'm in this, I'm going to, from there to, I want to get a pizza or something. It was open late because I left late. And just to get to this one thing, my, even my GPS took me three, to, three, t- it took me four times to, do, to, for the GPS to give me the right directions. So not only did I screw myself up, but the, the electronics that was around me was messing up. So um, uh, one of my clients after that I did, and I said, well, this is your session. But I, I said, can you ask a question for me to the council over there? And they said, yeah, Regan, you're doing too many. He says, just try to keep it to like every other day, if you can at the most because then you can be balanced and you won't this, you know, you're not going to die. It says, we don't want to see you up here too soon. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I said, me neither. I know. It's like that. That. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and I was told even before by a, a, a very spiritual person before said, look, if we were enlightened all at once uh, it, it, with this human body, we'd end up in, in, in a mental institution, you right. know, because it's just, there's so much out there. And, and it's, it's like, don't you find that with all of us here that we've kind of got everything piecemeal, you know, we mm-hmm. get a nugget and a nugget and a nugget, you know, and it just keeps on going. Um, well, that's how re- yeah, revelation I works. I mean, you, one might question why did revelation, even if you're looking just at the Judeo-Christian worldview, why did revelation take like this four year span, 4,000 year span? Um, yeah. You know, it's because of, I think, what you just said, that uh, were the Jewish people ready for Jesus Christ at that moment, you know, um, or, or, you know, at the time of the first temple, could they have handled Jesus Christ if he had come then? Um, I don't think there's also an element of the tower of Babel. Well, there's, you there know, you go. That's a very good example. You know, because, yeah. because, yeah, we can't possibly think, well, we can think it. <laughs> we, can, we can't cope with the idea that we can, you know, reach such a, a point of and personal revealed enlightenment to know all things yes. uh, and think that that can sustain itself. And the Tower of Babel um, passage tells us exactly that. You know, you try and build this tower to God. Yeah. Well, in fact, you'll find out, in fact, that you you speak different languages because you've all got little bits. Yeah. And yeah. so, um, and the, you can't amalgamate those because, it you know, um, well, it's a form of idolatry, right? But but it's also too much to bear. And you the know, fracture and also, is the God's different religions. God's made us this way to, well, and, he, and God's made us this way so that we have to commune together, that, we, that, we, that we're actually made to be in relationship with one another. Mm, yeah. uh, and so actually no one person is supposed to know all these things because otherwise, um, it, well, that person would be really lonely for a start, but there'd, <laughs> there'd be, um, it would fail to see the, the purpose in every life, no matter how degraded it may be by sin and circumstances and all sorts of things. That in fact, I think that's a good way to look at it. The Tower of Babel. I've, that's it, when I was growing up, you know, because I grew up Catholic. I was an altar boy in a couple churches. Uh, the priests were always awesome, cool. I remember uh, Father Gabrielli. Um, I didn't realize at that time, but I, I he might have, you know, before he would go out, he would mixing the wine, you know, the wine and stuff out there. Yeah. And he had a couple of shots even before he went out, you know. <laughs> he, he <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you were talking about the alcohol earlier, that's what brought back. I remember Fiber Gabriel, I can even see his head going, you know, and he poured another one. And then he would go out and, and that. And I always loved, I always loved kneeling there. And I like to be the one that did the bells. Yeah. You know, that was so much fun for me, you know, yeah, yeah. And, you know, stuff. So, you know, I grew, I grew up Catholic and I have um, me doing this work now has given me so much appreciation for my Catholic upbringing, because now I understand a lot of things that the church was not able to to educate me in because they were just so much into ritual and not right. explaining what the rituals meant and what the, what the significance of all of the things they were doing was, you know, it's a big problem, uh, isn't it? Yeah. Like confession. I mean, you know, when you're a young kid growing up, uh, you know, uh, like when I was a Jesuit high school, I went all the way through Catholic high school, you know? So here's us. Uh, <laughs> it was funny. We had, um, we had, I remember when father Morley, uh, was uh, talking to us about celibacy, you know, yeah. and here we are at the peak of our sexual, you know, whatever's going through our body. And he's yeah. talking about, you know, when you become a, a priest, you know, there's going to be none of that. And all of us looking at each other going, we ain't being braced, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, 
you know, we're talking about sexual stuff. So, and then we had confession right after that. And so it was, a there was like 12 of us, I remember lined up for confession and everybody's looking at each other and they go, how many times did you, uh, you know, go, oh, and they say, oh, six times, okay, eight times, you know, says, you know, so I'm just <laughs> imagining <laughs> all the fathers hearing in there. He's going, oh my God, you know, all these young boys, you know. Uh, it, oh, I can like, tell you when like, you do the, when you do the middle school crowd, masturbation is the only sin that you hear yeah. when you're in the confessional. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, it's a constant but, repeating. Uh, Congratulations, uh, you're normal. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, but now having this bigger picture, and I realize what a blessing confession is for people. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh yeah. I mean, because we all screw up so much of the time. If we couldn't start over, if we couldn't know we could have a new beginning, we we would be so mentally messed up that it would. That, you know, that's what's gone. That's what's happening in our society. It's yeah. people who are who have condemned themselves because they they they're, they're not aware that they can be released from that. And then also, and then even more perverse is people then fall in love with their scars and they don't want to leave them behind, which is, you know, that's a real, I mean, talk about purgatory, you know, Mm -hmm. not wanting in fact to be healed. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Rejecting healing. Yeah. It happens to Jesus in the gospels all the time. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Do you actually want to be healed? It's a, a great question. Yeah. Well, now remember when we when I did the show and we were talking about the energy psychology and oh, it's just some of the saddest sessions I've done when I'm having people do the tapping the EFT there's yeah. they're talking about their mm-hmm. issues. Okay? So they're letting they're talking about the issues they're all emotional but we're tapping I, I still do that by the way. Oh, I still do I'll that. Tell you, it's, it's so many miracles. I, I think I, I told you on the show of the man that came to me whose son came up and at nighttime put a gun to his head and shot him. And um the bullet went in his ear, it came out down his, in his cheek. So it didn't go up in his brain, luckily, you know, yeah. uh, but he was, and then he, he didn't press charges against us. He, he lied to the police about whatever. So he didn't get his son in trouble. And then his son dies of a drug overdose a few weeks later. And he's, he loved his son deeply, but he was, you know, and his, his son was in gangs and his, some Hispanic gangs. The father was 48 years old. He'd been in prison because of gangs and stuff. He'd been shot six times. The father had never died. That's why he came to me. He ran across Michael Newton's book, The um, um, Journey of Souls, which are, talks about all this stuff that we're talking about today. And um, he read it and he's thinking, there must be a God. I must be alive for some reason. You know, he'd also been on a, uh, his car got stuck on a railroad track and it, the, the train totally demolished his car and he walked out with a couple of cuts. Jeez. He has six bullet holes from that. He's got, uh, he had um, uh, 11 children from eight different women you know, because of his gang stuff, you know, and stuff. So anyway, his son doing that. Well, when I did the, uh, I did the tapping for him, he went in in a scale of one to 10. He said he was a 23. I mean, he was just beside himself with this, with this thing about happening, what his son did and all that. We did the tapping and in, and within 20 minutes, he checked in with himself again and his face just, I'll never forget his face where he's look, he's looking around for all that. What was a 23, 20 minutes before. And now he said, He said the F word. He goes, ah, it's like, it feels like a four now. Wow. I went from a 23 to a four. He came back another session, went to zero. And three months later, came back. He says, and it was a zero again. He says, I know my son shot me. I know that he died and I miss him terribly still, but I'm, I'm not doing this now every time I think about it, you know, so it, you know, it really works, but there's a point in there where that I'm trying to get to is that, when they're talking about their issues, we stop and go to their higher self and they'll say, even though I have this horrible thing happen to me, I love and accept myself. I have been so surprised at how many people cannot say that or how they start to cry. Oh, and it's, it's choking me up now thinking about it, about they, they're trying to say they cannot get the words out that they love themselves because they feel so guilty. They feel so bad. So thank God for confession because you know, if they have something like that where they can go and just pour their heart out to the priest or somebody like that and walk out of there going, okay, okay, I'm going to do these Our, our Father's Hail Marys. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be okay. And I can start again. You know, what a blessing that is, you know. Unfortunately, you people know, don't I, really I, 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 take I, I, advantage I, of it in, in, in the way that they should. But I, I wish more people well, yeah, but also understood the, the, it. The church, the church is also um, – cowardly I, I went to a catholic church i won't say where i went into a catholic church fairly uh, last week and um they had the, there's two 
banks of traditional confessionals, you know, two doors and two doors. And there was a notice on both of them saying confessions aren't heard in this church in line with our safeguarding policy. Uh, please attend the cathedral to make your confession. Oh, for goodness oh, sake. Oh, wow. And I that's, just a, that's, thought, that's, that's sacrilege. That is scandalous. Mm -hmm, that it is. is. I, I, I can't even, I did stop myself from ripping down the sign. Um, I, I wouldn't. Norm, I would normally have just gone. <laughs> you know, I would have ripped it. But, um, <laughs> I, well, I have done similar things before, but yeah. I, I'm trying to behave. Yeah. Um, I, but yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I was absolutely. I, I'm incandescent, incandescent with rage about it. So think, you know, that's just cowardly. I understand it from from a secular point of view. I understand it. Thinking, oh gosh, how can we how can we make ourselves le less vulnerable to being sued for people making claims against people? We'll put a sign up and we'll stop hearing confessions. Well, that's an wow. example of secular logic completely undermining the entire purpose of the church. Yeah, really. Well, I like um, um, the church the isn't safe. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, in the in the Protestant uh, viewpoint now, I mean, their big thing is to confess to one of your fellow men. You know, in other words, get somebody you can trust aside and just just to confess. You know, to just to get it out there. Um, when I was there the first time, and maybe maybe this is it. I think about it almost every day. So I'll mention it again because this thing that I felt that I got forgiveness when I was on my way back from the other from heaven, in a sense, and I and, and a. And it was before just what I told you about where I decided to do this work and that thing happened. As I was seeing the earth, um, all of a sudden, I found myself on a cliff. Uh, and this was the same cliff of the first dream that I ever wrote down back in my 20s where it was so powerful. I got up and wrote it down and shook my wife awake. Uh, and it was such a powerful dream where in the dream I had crashed on an airplane. I was a survivor and there was about a half a dozen of us that were in this jungle. And all of a sudden there was this evil that was there that we felt and we knew we had to get away or this monster was going to devour us. So we ran up this mountain and it was almost like a cartoon mountain where it goes, zoop, 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 you know, up to the top. Well, I remember running for my life and just thing, whatever this evil was behind me was going to devour me. Well, I get to the very top. There's no place to go. And uh, just as I looked down out of the clouds, we were above the clouds, there was a giant, it looked like a Pillsbury, Pillsbury, Pillsbury Doughboy, Doughboy, Doughboy and, yeah. you know, like a comic kind of thing coming up out of the clouds. And I knew instinctively I could jump to that to safety because it was a friendly hand, you know, or, and I remember at the time in this dream, I'm thinking, I have to make a decision here. Do I jump into this giant hand to be saved or do I turn around and face this evil that's following me? And I said, I'm going to turn around. And as I did that, God pushed pause on that. Now here I am 40 something years later, I find myself right where that was put on pause as I'm coming back from heaven. And I have the same choice to make again. And my facilitator says, well, jump to the hand of safety. And I screamed. I remember, no, I'm going to turn around and face it. I turned around and there's a man about two inches from my face smiling at me. <laughs> and he says, Regan, I forgive you. And he gave me a hug. And I looked to the side of him and there was people as far down as I could see down this mountain, all lined up to come and hug me and say that they forgive me for what I've done. I guess it's from other lifetimes of things I've done. I've never cried, so I was just laying there crying and crying, and I'm thinking, what did I do to this person? What did I do to there? And they all, I don't know, I, I came out of that, I felt like like 10 tons of bricks just left me, you know? And I think it was needed for me to do this work, because I couldn't be, I needed to have all that forgiveness. So it was like going to a hundred confessions all at one time, you know, <laughs> getting that forgiveness, you know? So, I mean, that's how powerful these sessions can be sometimes when you, you know, you, you, you get the healing, uh, you know, that you need. You talked so, about I, in uh, uh, that there were six sort of levels or, or, or well, separations. And how, how, how does that work with heaven? Okay. Uh, what we've discovered so far in this research is uh, seven different state. We call them stations. So seven. There's seven. Like places to go. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll I'll name them um, if I can remember them all here. Yeah. But it's uh, the first is a place of rejuvenation, which in itself is is a oh my gosh, oh that's just such a a happy place for people to go to to feel themselves being cleansed. 
Uh, and then there's the, the council that you can go before to get your questions answered. There's the soul group, which are souls that you're closest to in heaven, you know, people that are like your acting troupe or people that have somehow gotten together all these d- d- through through heaven and your favorite people that's there. Uh, there's the the library, which some people call Akashic Records or something, you mm-hmm. know, where it has a, a, a record of everything you've ever been and done before. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a place of recreation where you can kind of, if you want to peek in and see what everybody does there. And it's not a bunch of people sitting around, you know, playing their different harp songs, you know. <laughs> it's like, it's either <laughs> really fun up there you know yeah and there's the sixth place was the place of life selection where people have actually gone back to the memory they have of of sitting in this place and watching the possible lifetimes they could have with advisors and that there about what you know trying to help and advise them because of what they want to learn and what they want to teach and that and uh it's everybody what's interesting is everybody describes the same place you know that's what makes this this so real because these other people don't know these other people and they're different ages and different sexes and they describe it uh, the same um and i'm trained to think with oh and the other place is these temples of we call them golden wisdom and this is the fun part of the sessions for people like if they're artists or um you know places where are writers um paint you know painters uh sculptures uh dancers uh, if I know what their background is, because if I, I ask them these questions and for instance, I had a woman that came to me and she's in her fifties now, and she's been a dancer on Broadway for like 20 years and she's not getting parts anymore. And she knows it's because of her age. They're picking all the young girls, you know, now. Yeah. And so she's up there and she's really sad about it. And she asked the council, like, what, what can I do? <laughs> and they were very kind to her, but they said, time to be a teacher, hmm. you know? Time to teach Time the to young be a teacher. people coming up. And okay. she kind of knew that and everything, but they, you know, that helped her to kind of get to that. But now she's also a great salsa dancer. She's been looking for a partner that's her, that's up to her level and, and yeah. she's not had any luck. So I happened to think, I said, well, ask them, is there a place where people that do dance can go for inspiration? They said, yes. She finds herself immediately in this big dance hall. And I said, tell me what you're seeing. And she says, wow, there's these people over here and they're doing the cha-cha and some people over here are doing a waltz. And, oh, my gosh, there's a salsa and people doing salsa. Now it confused me because I thought, okay, what music are they listening to? What answer am I going to get? She says, oh, no, we're all hearing the music that we need to hear for our dance. You know, pretty cool. I thought that's a pretty, that's cool, pretty cool answer. Cool. So then I asked, I asked her guide that was there. I says, is, does there happen to be a salsa teacher here? Boom, there's a salsa teacher. And this is going to sound crazy, people, but this is so beautiful the way it is in heaven there and they said yeah this is this salsa teacher helps inspire people for dance because dance is a form of love it's a form of expression you know that's why we all love to you know people have to move you know it's a good good spiritual thing and so then i said i said i said would it be possible for my client to have a dance with this thing they said sure so i'm just quiet and i'm watching her in trance and you should have seen her face oh my god she was just experiencing it let me me, let's hold off right there we're going to go to the um, final break here it is beautiful we're going to go to the final break um and we'll be back here in just about i don't know six or seven minutes and we'll return to the discussion to start taking your questions don't go away just a little secret I didn't hear the sirens I didn't want to see the one inside us And now I pay the price, yeah Oh, I should've known It hits me like a tidal wave Every time you say my name It hits me like a tidal wave
dreams It's our childhood dreams It's how it used to be But we were kings and queens In our childhood dreams Welcome back, everybody, to the third and final hour of Vestiges After Dark. We've been talking with Regan Forsten about the afterlife and uh, his experiences, as well as his research in this area, what heaven is like. And um, it's all been very fascinating. When we come back here, um, we'll continue the discussion and start looking at some of your questions. If you'd like to talk to us, uh, ask a question directly to Regan, you can call right into the show at 718-362-6380. That's 718-362-6380. Uh, enter pin number 855-4111 to get put into the queue. That's 855-4111. I'll have that up on the screen here for this third hour in just a moment. You can also call in free if you're international by dialing up Skype. Uh, Eye of the Seer. Just call Eye of the Seer on Skype and we'll bring you on. More to come. Don't go away. You know, when we were, um, I would say, last week, when we were talking about psychic seduction, one of the things that we were discussing um, was the nature of experience and the nature of reality. And um, reality 
um, I have always defined, at least at its highest, purest form, is not what we can objectively know to be true through consistent or making consistent observations, um, but rather what endures forever, what exists forever. And the only thing that we have access to in our current understanding of reality, the only thing that is eternal in this universe that is ruled by entropy is information. That's the only one thing that will always be, has always been, and can't be eradicated as far as we know. Um, seems to be a, a property, you might say, of this universe. Everything else, though, is up for grabs. It's all in a state of, of, of entropy, which is breaking down into uh, or degrading down into uh, non-existence. Um, so when you compare that, I guess, somewhat scientific understanding to religion, it gets very interesting. Now, some scientists or atheists or, you know, might look at this and say, oh, wait a second, um, you're, you're taking it too far. Scientific observation, scientific method, that is the highest form of truth. But I beg to differ because if I were to create a fictitious reality, if I were to create a virtual reality that was indistinguishable from actual life and put people in it, hook them up to this computer simulation and put them in it, um, and let's say in my universe, you can go... Um, you can go faster than the speed of light, but I create an algorithm that prevents them from doing so in the simulation. Then all of the observations being made by those individuals hooked up to the simulation are ruled by the simulation. So yes, the observations are true, but the reality is not true. The observation is an error because they're looking at it and saying, oh wait, we can't go faster than light. But outside the simulation, as soon as you d detach from it, you can. I'm not so sure something similar to that, although I'm not, and I, like I said last week, and I'm going to kind of present this to Regan to see what he thinks, um, I, I'm not going to go as far as to say is that we're living in a simulation. But what I will go as far as to say is that Buddhists and Hindus are correct when they say that what we observe of the phenomenal universe is not accurate. It is a appearance. It is a fabrication that is the interpretation of energy in a consistent way so that we can uh, make assessments and judgments about it. However, it isn't authentically true. It's just uh, subjectively true. It's true enough to say that we're gathering an experience here and the experience is true. We're having a genuine experience. I'm not saying that everything here that's happening is not really happening. That would be, that's ludicrous because the I think, therefore I am, does have validity to a certain extent. What I'm talking about is what is actually true, not what is subjectively true or conventionally true, but what is actually true at an absolute level. So when we get to that, it and compare it to some of the metaphysics of other religions like Buddhism that sort of does like, do, do explorations like this. Um, there's some things that came to mind over the last hour that, you know, when Regan was talking. And, and Regan, I want to present this to you because I know that you're a researcher. You're not just somebody that, you know, talks to people and helps them through experiences and, you know, does past life uh, explorations and hypnosis and all that stuff. You're also a researcher, which means that at the, at the fundamental level, your highest uh, obligation is to the truth. And I think it would be interesting to know if there is some, um, if, if you find in, in, in your research some validity to what it is that I'm about to say. So in Buddhism, Christianity has, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, they don't have anything in the West that sort of correlates to this. But in Buddhism, they understand or they, the focus is rather than on a God or a deity, which I think sometimes can get in the way. If, 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 if that's, <laughs> and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean it in a way that it's like the, the Western religions of the book are so focused on God that sometimes the metaphysics gets lost in it. And in Buddhism, because they're not focused on 
the deity aspect of nature, they're more concerned with what we're experiencing. And so they can come up with some interesting conclusions. So one of the things that Buddhism, particularly in the Vajrayana school of Buddhism, um, that they have determined is that they are six gati, they call them. These are not locations, okay? These are conditions. These are states that we can find ourselves in at any point. In fact, life or death are also to Buddhists at the Vajrayana Vajrayana school, merely appearances. There is no life. There is no death. It's just part of the fundamentals of the story that we put together, the fabrication that we create. And the authenticity is beyond all of this. But the appearances take place within six gati. And the gati themselves are appearances. And those six gati are, um, we're right in the middle. We're in the human realm. So that is um, gati, uh, let me see. So let me, let me work down, then we'll work up. So the human realm is in the middle of the six gati. The next lower realm down is the animal realm. The next one down is the hungry ghost realm. And the next one down is the hell realm. And then working up from the human realm, there's the demigod realm, and then there's the heaven realm. And all of these in Vajrayana are considered to be appearances. They are not authenticities. They are experiential appearances that we create, we fabricate out of our own um, awareness to experience and make sense of the, the chaotic exchange of energy that is the universe. And so the human realm in Buddhism is considered to be the most sacred of all of the six gati because it is here that we can experience both the pain and suffering as well as the bliss and happiness of the other realms, which makes this so sacred because it is only here that we don't get so washed out in happiness and bliss that we just of, we don't want to. We don't want to think about anything else. It just feels too good. So it's almost like a drug trip. It's almost like a person that's high on dope and they don't want to come down from the from the high. So they stay in this blissed out state. That's how Buddhists see uh, the demigod and heaven realms. But if we're suffering too much, then you can't focus on anything spiritual or, or progressive or anything that would get you to evolve spiritually because you're in too much pain and sorrow. So the hell realms are definitely not the way to go. There's the human realm where we get to experience both and we can control to a certain degree that balance depending upon what we focus on. So if we're very negative people, we'll spend most of our time in the hell realms. If we're very optimistic people, we'll spend most of our time in the heaven realms. And death is really just the incorporeal side of the universe. It's the incorporeal side of, of the experience, but it's not happening out there. It's not somewhere else. It's right here with us. It's just what your experiential faculties are able to uh, uh, encounter through the appearances of the fabrication of, of the Maya, as they would call it in Hinduism and Buddhism. So my question is this, Nirvana has never been a correlation to heaven. Um, which is w one of the fundamental things that separates, I guess, Christian thinking from Buddhist thinking and why the two think that they can't be compatible because it's like, well, we're not really interested in heaven. It, Buddhists will say, we're not really interested. It's just another illusion. We need to move beyond that. Nirvana is beyond that. It is beyond the point of experiential uh, appearances. We're now, we're seeking the authentic truth. Whereas, in, in, again, in these gati, I should have mentioned this, just like you live and die here in the human realm, you know, we get maybe 70, 80, 90, maybe 100 years here if we're lucky. Uh, I mean, assuming you consider that lucky, I don't know. I mean, if you're, if you're in good health, I guess depends it's lucky. Yeah, are, but it depends yeah. on how healthy you are. But I mean, you know, you get, you know, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years, and then you die. And then in the heaven realms, you could have thousands of eons, in a state of perfect bliss, but eventually it's also subject to entropy and it fades away. And then you return to one of the other six gati. Hopefully you've returned to a human realm where you have control again, you can make progress because only in the human realm can you make progress as they understand it. So my question is this, all of these things that we're experiencing in, in, in near-death experience, spiritual encounters, the mystical experiences of people like Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, um, you know, all of these encounters that we have, um, are they vehicles through which we can 
try to assemble some kind of comprehension of the madness that is this universe, the, 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 the incomprehensibility of God, which is so far beyond the human experience that we need some kind of story to relate to it. So what God gives us is an archetypal story to play out. Whether we're alive or dead does not matter. That's just part of the story too, which is why some people might experience things that they uh, um, they encounter as reincarnation, but it's not really necessarily reincarnation. It's just you're telling a different story as a different character, but it's still ultimately the same person having the same experience, the same observation, looking for the authentic truth. So is it really accurate to say that we're trying to get to heaven as much as it's accurate that we're trying to have heaven lead us to the ultimate truth, which I think is, and let me leave you with this last thought, not not incompatible with Christianity because I think that's exactly what Jesus is trying to say by referring to it as the kingdom that is to come. In other words, he doesn't promise heaven tomorrow or heaven at death. What is promised here is that in the end of time, when time no longer is a factor, which means that we're no longer playing the role, we're no longer in the Maya, we're no longer in the appearance of the illusion, and we wake up to authentic truth, then at that point, we have arrived at the actual condition, which is beyond all of the appearances. So is it that these near-death experiences are also just part of the experiential exercise of humanity to get us there? Like what we're having now is not any any better or any worse than what we're having in an afterlife experience. In fact, it's really not an afterlife experience. It's just part of the story to get us further along. Um, but yet we're not, we're so disconnected for the authentic truth that we can't possibly know it. So what we get is little snippets through the story that God gives us to play out as actors in the story through the various archetypes that make up the human psyche. What are your thoughts on that in relation to your research, Regan, because I'm fascinated to know. Um, and we've wow. been talking a lot about that on this show. <laughs> That's very handy. Yeah, it is. It is. But I love it. But I really, I think I get, okay. Now, that some of this is just going to be coming from my, just my experience. I don't know about some of the other therapists and everything. But when I went the second time, I think, I, I don't know if I was on the show since I went to heaven the second time. But um, 28 of us therapists, we did it over Zoom and we traded sessions and we wanted to go to ask about COVID and the vaccines. And then we put all the information together and then we did a PowerPoint presentation on, you know, and pretty much all of us had the same uh, the, the same things, you know, that, that happened. Uh, but um, when I was finishing my session with the council over there, we got all that done. I was, did some personal stuff and I asked uh, my the guy that was on my council, he's this. I always call him a late C. He was like Chinese looking entity or gentleman that when he smiles at you, you just can't help but smile back. I mean, it's that <laughs> love. Yeah. He's just an amazing guy. And I said, I said, late C, I said, um, this place that you're allowing us therapists to have people visit. I said, is this it? You know, is this heaven like what we're seeing right now? And he jumps, he's, he's sitting down, he jumps up and he goes, like that and smiling and laughing mm -hmm. like you haven't seen anything yet. Yeah. You know? So what they were saying and what they told me over there was um, the thing that they're most concerned with about us people that we consider like all of us here are light workers in one way or another. In other words, light workers, meaning we're trying to help other people to get a little more understanding of what life is, a little more understanding how they can be better people, how they can give more love. OK. Sure. And. Um, um, what he, you know, what he was uh, saying is that this, like I say, this part here, they just want people to know and, and get proof that there is an afterlife. They want them to know that their life has meaning and purpose, that they have a mission down here to make things, you know, to be more loving and kind. And the fact that they're never alone, you know, that's the three main things they want people to get, because that's what we need for what we're doing at this moment, which is where we're concentrating on this life. Okay. Not other lifetimes or future lifetimes where we, you know, it's like if you were working for a company and thinking about a job, you're going to have 10 years from now and not doing the work you're supposed to be doing at that where you're hired to do, right. you know, you're not getting anything done. Right. Um, so I believe what you said was, is that, um, for us in this in this human body, 
we have they they a lot of times give us things that this computer here can process you know uh but knowing like now we have this process here but there's supercomputer somewhere in the world here that's got all of google's information or something that, that we don't have as individuals but that place has it you know yeah. so if you know it, in other words we kind of get at whatever level that we get to um there's more files that get put on our desk and say okay now you've got to this level you can look at these files that you couldn't look at before you know and then you open it up and you go oh my god how am i going to do this you know kind of thing but um what they said that they're mostly concerned with over there is that each of us should be just helping whoever we run into, we should be helping them to reach their next step in evolution, no matter what that is, whether that's, you know, going back to church on Sunday, you know, whether that's to go find a religion that, that, that feeds them one, that one that they can feel that they're doing something to, uh, to get themselves in a group of like-minded people that are, are doing good, you know, uh, to go back reading the Bible again and, and going to a Bible study or to learn meditation, you know, because everybody's at a different step, you know, like everybody doesn't need to do, go through the sessions that I'm doing. Some of them just need to be aware that it's possible and that yeah. will help them go, Oh, wow. There's a place, uh, there is a real heaven. And maybe I don't need to actually see it myself, but I know here's 70,000 people that have been there that are saying, yes, it, it, you know, it's like people could say, you know, who've never been to Disneyland, you know, and we all kind of feel we've been there because we've heard so many stories, even though if you've never been, you kind of believe that it's there because people have gone there and told you what it's about, you know, that's kind of like this, you know, it's like, um, like that. So um, that was very humbling for me, you know, to say that like, Hey Regan, just, just talk about this, you know, it'll, it'll maybe spur people to, to meditate or to take a mindful class, you know, or to wake up in the morning and like that prayer that I said, where you just wake up and you say, God, I'm your vehicle today. Okay. What can I do? You know, something simple like that can change people's lives. You know, it sounds Uh, like the lesson ultimately, the lesson is that, um, the, the 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 transition from life to death is not really a big deal. Um, the the experience of humanity encompasses all of it, and that there is more to experience. Um, I think where we might be getting caught up is that this idea that we go to heaven and that's it, that's where it stops. When in reality, that's probably just the beginning. Um, and that there is a great deal more, um, infinitely more beyond even that, because that's yeah. still caught up in the human experience. And we kind of have to evolve beyond the human experience to get to that next point. Um, that's what it sounds like. Yeah. And OK, to give you some sense, too, this was a surprise to us. OK, so people are in heaven and they go, OK, God, where are you? I want to see you. I want to come shake your hand. I want you to give me a hug or something like that. Well, when we when people ask that over the where's God, even in this part of heaven that they're in, it's kind of like they go around, you know, kind of like what like, dreams may so come all around. Do you remember the movie What Dreams May Come with Robin Williams? Yeah. Yes, he asked like, yeah. "Where's God?" Oh, and 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 Cuba Do- Gooding Jr. is like, "He's up there." You think you know? He's kind of like an ambiguous thing. It's like here no. you are in heaven, but yet God's still kind of ambiguous. So that makes it, it, sense because God, God is eternally unknowable yes. to us. Uh, yes. oh, yeah. Otherwise, you wouldn't be God, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> but people say that when they're in this part of heaven, they feel the presence at a much greater degree. You know, they feel that love, like like there's been like uh, layers of us taken off to where we can actually feel it. Yeah. I want to tell you about this experience. Um, that one of my uh, Christian clients had that came to me. Um, and her experience with Jesus on the other side, because I think of this so many much time because it was so beautiful the way he appeared to her. Um, she's uh, someone that's been um, uh, working for our family here for like 20 something years. And she's from Guatemala and she's been having health issues. Um, it's scleroderma. I, it, and what happens is you get the hardening of everything until yes. pretty soon you die. Yes, you know? it's and, awful. Um, she's a housekeeper. And when she walks in, I mean, she just lights every time she comes in. She's so full of joy. And she she's has Jesus on her mind 24-7. I mean, everywhere she goes, she doesn't preach it to anybody, but it's like her beingness. Yeah. You know, you all you know people like that, right? Of course. Yeah. Just, oh, yeah. Just they love, you know. Yeah. And so I told her, I knew she was Christian, and, uh, and her English is still not really, really good, so I have a little bit of a hard time understanding her. But I said, look, um, 
I, I said, well, I'm doing this thing now where when we get to before the council, we, we ask if we can talk about your health issues. And then um, uh, I say, can I ask her higher self, which is the higher part of ourselves that's always in heaven. I says, can the higher self kind of uh, address these health issues or do you have a healer here? And about, I'd say about 70% of the time they say, no, we have somebody here. And then all of a sudden there's a healer or a being before my client and we discuss their health issues. They do a body scan for them. They, they can tell them if, oh, you, maybe your doc go to see the doctor over this or that. It's just amazing what happens. Uh, but um, so I thought, well, maybe I can help her with her scleroderma because her hands, she has to put her hands under warm water in the morning so she can move them. Mm-hmm. So um, she was, you know, when we're over there, we got a lot of her questions answered and everything. And I said, well, is Jesus around that she could have a con, you know, talk to him because she has some issues she'd like to talk to, to help her with, with her, you know, her, what she needs in her life. And there was Jesus. He was like 60 feet tall. And he was this, at, the, at the beginning of this, he was a big statue and, and it was this big statue of Jesus. And then um, all of a sudden she saw all these souls that were running to Jesus. And as they ran and they grabbed his garment, they became part of that statue. Can you imagine that? It was like this, Hmm. in other words, it was beautiful. This, 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 how he was showing here, this picture of all these souls that were that Jesus, you know, that loved incorporated into his body. Yeah. He was because they were becoming part of Christ, you know, this way. It's a good icon of the church. Sounds like Rio de Janeiro, actually. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 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 That gave me goosebumps because that was so powerful. And, And then, and then he became human and she asked him about, she was estranged from her daughter. And she says, look, I don't know why I love everybody and that, but for some reason I'm estranged from my daughter. I don't know how to get to her. I, I just feel so horrible inside because I love her so much and we're just estranged. And Jesus bowed down. He bowed down below her. And I says, what is he showing you? And he goes, he's showing me that I need to be humble around my daughter. You know, oh, that was, just, wow. it was beautiful. It was so beautiful. Yeah. He told her, he says, look, when you talk to your daughter, when you're talking to your daughter, you, do, you don't be the mother of your daughter. Just be soul to soul. Listen to her. She just needs somebody to listen to. She doesn't need you being the mom telling her that she should do this and that and everything else. Um, and um, I just thought that was, he just showed her through example, yeah. you know, look, just be humble around your daughter. So that really helped. She was crying, you know, and that uh, the healing part. Um, three weeks later, she comes knocking on the door. It wasn't even her time to come. She knocks on the door. And when she opened the door, she goes, look, Regan. Wow. She's doing it with her fingers, you know. Wow. And so cool. now this has been about eight or nine months ago. And it, she's starting to feel a little, her hands are starting to feel a little bit that way again. So I said, well, look, uh, you know, we're going to do another session. I do them for free for her, you know, because yeah. she's so like part of the family. Yeah, sure. And I said, Go back and let's let's see what we can do to uh, to help help you further. So that's just a beautiful. And the the other one I had were it was a Catholic woman, seventy two years old. Another beautiful. Oh my gosh, she was just so delightful to do a session for. She's having a talk with Jesus. There's tears running down her eyes. I started crying. I'm next to her because I can feel her emotion and everything. And um, and then she's laughing. And, and then when she's done, I says, OK, I can't wait to hear what did what did what did Jesus talk to you about? And he said, Jesus just held me. And he says, you know what? All you have to do is think of me and I'm there. You know, I'm here for you. I love you. Oh, my gosh. And she said, just feeling that energy. And then Mother Mary showed up. And this is what was interesting. And, and this woman, too, was estranged from her daughter. This is so interesting. And so. The laughing part was that it's like two moms talking about their kids. You know, she says, Mother Mary was talking about how he, how Jesus was as a boy and he was a little ball of energy. And, and, uh, and, um, uh, and then she was talking about her daughter and everything. So they were doing this mom to mom talk. And then Jesus was there. I mean, it was, it was, um, it was a very meaningful thing. And the third one was a man who was a young man. Oh my gosh. When he went to a past lifetime, uh, when he came out onto the other side and all of a sudden he's, he's almost screams and it scared the heck out of me. He's saying nails, nails. And I'm thinking, Oh my God, what's going on? You know, in this yeah. thing. And um, anyway, I, I didn't know what to do. So I ended it at that point and we talked about it and he says, Regan, I was upside down on a cross and I was nailed. And oh. that's what he was feeling. You know, he was feeling into that body. So I did another session with him come to find out 
he was a young man from the synagogue and this other it was a jeremiah was his friend they were going around prophesizing that the the savior was about to be born the messiah was coming and he got kicked out of the temple they thought he was some kind of you know nut you know so he couldn't go in the temple anymore mm. and um the thing is he never met jesus but as we explored his past life there uh, jesus was always away somewhere and everything but um he ended up being one of the followers of jesus and was crucified for that you know when the romans came in and they crucified him upside down now here's the interesting thing he wasn't a practicing Christian, but ever since he was a young man, he bought a crucifix and he turned it upside down and he'd always worn it underneath yeah. his uh, clothes. Like a, that's called the St. Peter's yeah. cross. It's interesting because the, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the, 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 right. the, the Satanists think that they are good, like they're being all clever by yeah. turning no. their crosses upside down. But in reality, <laughs> either direction, each orientation is a Christian symbol. <laughs> Yeah. Now, I Regan, know. I don't want to take any time from the audience. Uh, do we oh, have yeah. questions from the audience on the chat? Or And remember, you guys can call in to the show. We're taking your calls now. So we would love to hear from you if you want to call directly. But um, I know most people always like to talk in the chat. So right. um, what do we have out there, Brandon, Father Chris, Jamie, for, for Regan to answer? I think we have just uh, this question. Maybe a general question from Mystic Way Up Thread from earlier. She's asking about the Akashic Records, and are they similar to what we know as the Book of Life? Yeah, I would say it's just another term. You know, in other words, a Book of Life is, uh, and I, I can't say as I, I mean, I've heard that term and everything before, and when I hear, hear of that, that's what I think of. You know, is it just um, it's just getting like an accounting, like of everything we've ever done before. Um, well, just think about now when we go on Google. I mean, everything we Google is there is it for the record. It's like a like a, a Earth World Akashic Records of everything we've ever searched for. Yeah, you know, know yeah. what's about us. Yeah. But um, everything we think or do, sense of creation, is recorded. You know, I mean, it's like like this. Um, <clears throat> when I've had people that wanted to go there, it's been it's been interesting for me because they all explain it the same way. They find themselves with a teacher or a, a guide that's in this big, it's like a library. They always describe it as they're sitting there and it's like as far up as they can see into infinity, there's like books and things. And so they'll sit down and we'll ask if um, the guide there, if she can look at her past. And the, my clients so far, the ones that have done this, they'll sit there, they put this book before them. And so I'm quiet for a little bit. And I says, okay, I want you just to, you know, have your experience. And then when you're done, tell me what happens. And they say, what happens is this teacher will put this book in front of them and they're, they see themselves going through page by page and the pages are all light. Like each page is just light, you know, and they can feel in that state that they're reading or getting that information, but it doesn't translate to the human state a little bit to where they can say, Oh, uh, you know, I saw this past life or that, but they, they all say, I felt like some part of me got that information, you know, you know, that was there. Um, so that's to, at least my experience with the people that have, uh, uh, with the people that have, uh, gone there. Um, so, um, the, the people that go to these places of higher learning where they give inspiration, um, the artist, three artists that I've had that have been there, they find themselves in this art class. There's other souls that are doing paintings and things. And sometimes I say, well, go ask them if you can do some painting. And I remember uh, one of my clients, she goes, oh gosh, I'm painting. And she says, I'm making, they looks like calligraphy. It looks like um, these uh, uh, Chinese characters, you know? Mm -hmm. And I says, well, what are you writing? She goes, I don't know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> <just damn. laughs> but, um, when they told her, uh, she asked about how could she be a better painter all three times the teachers that were there told their my my clients you need to stop being so technical and you need to get more into your heart when you're doing your painting you know you need to paint and at two times they said you need to paint as if you're a child a happy child you know and uh, they, i remember two of them anyway said oh Boy, they got me, you know, because I'm always trying to do this technique and that technique. And he so says you lose some of that creativity. You lose some of that light that should be going into the painting when you get to be too technical, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. The, 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 I even had one, one client went to a comedy club up there. <laughs> and this is going to sound crazy. But then <clears throat> what happens is she's she's in deep trance. And again, she starts laughing so hard. I start laughing. It helped. It kind of brought her out of trance. I had to take her back down again. And then the guy that was there said the reason he showed her that is he wanted to give us a dissertation on why God 
on how, what God feels about humor. And he showed her in her mind's eye, like a PowerPoint presentation and a pie, you know, in other words, love is this whole pie. And it had a big section of it that was humor, you know, that that was part of love and how important that is. And then he began to give like a 10 minute dissertation through her to me that I haven't trans, I haven't transcribed it yet, but it was about the importance that God says that humor is so important is part of love and part it's, it, it's a gift that he's given us down here, oh, you know, to help with so many things to help us get through the tough times, you know, to help heal because, you know, we, we, we kind of know that there's a, the, the humor in that when you put you in a good state so your body can heal itself. You know, so that was, I found very interesting. And one of these days I got to get in there and I have to transcribe it because I think I'm supposed to, uh, so people can say what they're saying on the other side about, you know, time to laugh, laugh at yourself, you know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Brandon, do we have any questions that you've noticed from the oh, chat? Sorry, can I ask you a question? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, uh, yeah um, Father Chris, we know that Father Chris <laughs> has the has the plethora load. I mean, he's, he's got everything. <laughs> um. Regan, I, I, you, when you were on here, I think the first time you were, well, the first time you were on the show when I was on it, yeah, um, you, you, you know, you had a uh, an image of my granddad uh, here. Oh, and um, I, I'm I old enough to saying, be your granddad, I think. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I've got I've got plenty of white <laughs> in my beard, but um, uh, uh, so I have got a question related to this, so, uh, and you mentioned. Um, uh, did he call you son? You were getting son. And I, and, and my sister watches this show um, in retrospect because it's on. Uh, she's in a different time zone. Um, and she said, well, his name was Sonny. Even though we called him Bill, his, his actual his real name was actually Sonny. And so I thought I'd let you know that that was the case. Uh, yeah. But 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 also ahead of this, of the, knowing that you were on this week, uh, Saturday was the anniversary of my sister's death mm-hmm. and my uncle, who was his son, died on the same day you know of, of great age you know in his 80s and i just wondered do you think there's any connection between that between the fact that um i was going to speak to you again and and the yeah. the t- and two people who are directly related to that person <laughs> um, you know uh, those um, two things coincided well, I don't okay, know. Now i'm not sure i'm understanding you see you have your uh, sunny is what you called him right well, that was his actual name. His his um. That was his, and I'd forgotten because it, it. We, I people called him Bill. You know, um, in 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 the north of England, but he was from the south of England, and actually his name was Sonny. Um, so I just thought it was a connection I hadn't quite made. But um, yeah, but I'm, since. Not sure, I'm not sure if I'm understanding your question. So you're saying. <laughs> So say it again, because I was. I, I, I'm just. I, I, I'm just saying that that uh, my, it, on the anniversary of my sister's death, who was his granddaughter, also his son, my uncle, that of a great age, you know, expected, um, died, and I, and I just, I don't know. There seems to be a connection between this oh. side of my family and you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> But see, that's the thing. Like when people make their list of questions and they have curiosities like that, they're more than happy to take a minute and to to uh, tell you if there's anything there or not. Um, hmm. But the, the fact that you paid attention to that, that something came up, I mean, that's that's means something. You know, otherwise it would just gone by, you know, that way. Could I venture uh, to say that you, with all of your traveling, let's call it, that you've become sort of a liaison now to those that have passed on that, um, that if they are aware that you're connected to someone here um, that knows you uh, that they were like, well, we know this guy too. And we can, we can maybe relay a message um, across the, the chasm oh, of oh Regan Forston. Is that possible? Okay, I got to tell you what happened because maybe that's possible because I was doing a regular hypnotherapy session with um, a client of mine that has been abused in her life, 46 times abused and beaten and left for dead. And mm. I mean, she had things that are just, just to even, oh, I, I, it was way above my pay grade when I met her because yeah. I'm going, she needs somebody who knows more than me. But somehow we were energetically connected and I was the only person she felt comfortable with. Uh, we couldn't even do therapy like in a park or something like that because she's, she's, hyper vigilant like this all the time. Like, who's that? What are they looking, you know, because she's so scared of things. So we ended up doing, and I had a van, a traveling van. So we would do it there where she felt closed and felt safe. So 
um, she's talking about the guilt that she has for her sister that uh, overdosed at her house. The sister had been kicked out by the husband uh, because of her drug use. And so she came to be with her sister. Well, uh, my client, she came home and her sister was still alive, but she was convulsing and everything. And it, it, she didn't, you know, she didn't know what to do. She's running around. She calls the ambulance. She's holding her sister and she, her sister gets an ambulance and the sister died. OK, mm. uh, she had so much guilt over that, like thinking, oh, my gosh, what if I uh, just uh, five minutes earlier called the ambulance instead of not knowing what to do? Maybe I should have done CPR on her. You know, the thing that people do when they, you're there and you feel that you're supposed to do something and you don't know, don't know what to do. So her sister died and they were close. They were like really, really, really close. So all of a sudden I'm talking to her and I start humming. I stood, I just hummed. I don't know. I know I found myself humming. And I remember thinking to myself, why are you humming when your your client's right here or something? And my client says, what did you hum? Hum that again. Hum that again. Hum oh, that wow. again or something. And I, I could still kind of remember humming. And I hummed it. She goes, oh, my God, that's my sister and I's favorite song when we were kids. Hmm. We used to hum all the time. He says we would sing that song, whatever. I didn't even know what the name of the song was. And here I was humming it. We both started crying. I mean, yeah, I would like, too. Whoa, you know, I'm not thinking then that's what you just said about like, <laughs> I think sometimes when there's an opening and someone's there and someone's watching you from above, they'll use what they can to try to get a message. Mm. Well, and I like think that. particularly for someone like you who might be quite well known, you know, because you've connected to so many and having made these, these, um, you know, having made these journeys, let's call them. Um, that that you know the people that are in this state would would be aware of you and would also know that anybody that you come in contact with um you know you, you could relay a message and i wonder uh, if that's what it is you know it, it was like a form of channeling in yeah. a way i guess I yeah. that, that was uh, was through me here so Sounds i hadn't reasonable. thought that in years until you brought that up so you know, maybe there's uh, some some connection there. Um, the thing I want people to know, at least in this research, is you know, everybody that's passed on, they're doing just fine over there. If they're they're um, none of them are there's correct. What I say is we've not found any evidence of like a, a hell and fire brimstone that kind of thing. But what we have found is that there's correction. You know, in other words, if there's something that someone's done wrong, that there's ways they have over there in a loving in a loving, benevolent way that they work with them to correct those issues or to have them, you know, it's like if you're a benevolent father and your son uh, puts a, a, a baseball through the neighbor's window, you know, you don't, you know, come home and whip them to pieces. You know, you set them down and say, look, son, you made a mistake here, you know, and now you got to figure out, you're going to mow lawns, maybe go tell them you'll mow their lawn or whatever, but you know, some way that you can make restitution to make it right. In other words, to be responsible for, for the, um, uh, I would say for the negative things we cause others. So in a, in a sense, it's, it's the same thing that there's, there's a way of, you know, it's not like anybody gets away with anything. There's always a reckoning that happens, but it's always done in a, a benevolent way. Uh, the several suicides um, that's, I found out I've, I've only had two that I've had in the last three or four years of suicides and they were both very similar in what was going on with the people that commit suicide on the other side. And that was that there was kind of a long period of a long period of assimilating themselves back in heaven again. Uh, and that there was these loving angels or guides or whatever that were working with them, but they were still damaged um, themselves. Um, one of my clients, her husband, she came home, her husband had hung himself. And uh, again, she's like, oh my God, if I'd only got home 10 minutes earlier, you know, or what if I, you know, uh, whatever. And she was, she was so much in love with this man that she couldn't even go to work. She was so crushed and it had been six months. She was going to a regular therapist. The therapist knew what I did. And he says, look, I don't know if you'll believe in this kind of stuff, but go see Regan, see if you can find some resolution. She says, how's this thing work? I'm willing to try anything she was a good hypnosis subject went right there it took us a little bit to find him but when we did he was in a room and we asked the guy can she she has some questions if she has some she's hurting so much can she talk to him and and the guide this angel says you can speak with him but just for a few minutes so oh my gosh that was one of them i cried more than that when i thinking about anyone because she when she saw him and she was there face to face with him i mean she was crying uncontrollably in trance, you know, that way. And so I, I said, okay, um, I'm going to be quiet. I want you to have a conversation with them. Okay. 
when she was done, she says, she says, says, oh my God, I feel so, so, I, I feel, I still feel so much pain, but I, he, he told me that it had nothing to do with me. He said in the process of hanging himself, there was a point when he tried to reverse it, but he had done it so it couldn't be reversed, okay, because he thought that might happen. Mm. And he said, look, we've been together other lifetimes before. He says, I hope I don't blow it again this next time and whatever. And then a guide comes up and says, that's all the time you can have with him right now. And then he says to her, oh, I'm so afraid where they're taking me right now. So my first thing is, oh, my God, are they taking him to hell? or something, or were they going to do some, punish them or something? And, a, and I said, ask, ask your husband, where are they taking him? And the husband reported to her and says, they're taking me to show me what my life could have been like if I hadn't killed myself. Mm. And I went, wow, is that ever loving or what? You know, you know, that's it. Um, what about then, negative NDEs though? Um, we, we had a guest on, do you um, remember his name? It was a few seasons ago, but we had a guest on that actually brought his research in negative NDEs and hell experiences I think it was that last people year. had. Yeah, I don't remember the name. But. So I'm curious, uh, you, you've never, in the 70,000 cases, you've never encountered anything like that, Regan? No, um, that's very interesting because in the ones we've done, we've not found, um, uh, we've not had anybody that's had, like you say, a bad trip you yeah. know, over the back. Um, the best of that I could now, now this is just coming from me and I'd have to talk to some more of the other therapists because I think it would be good if we had more people over there asking more questions about this, uh, because it it would be good the way I now. Okay. Now this is just me. Okay. So anybody, if there's any other Newton Institute therapist watching this, it's just me from what I've gathered this place that they're letting people go to right now is kind of above that kind of thing, you know, yeah. in other words, heaven, in this place, there's no Satan, there's no evil, there's no that. I picture it again, like a big high rise, you know, and for, for learning and for everything in the school here that say, if it's 20 floors, well, on the 10th floor and below for people's learning experience and for all that, that, that what has been manifested is this good guy, bad guy kind of thing, or this, um, uh, this, this, what we sometimes look at as evil, you know, in, in, I look, in, in, I've heard that in the ancient terms or in the, in the Jewish writings of this, that the term instead of devil or something like that was um, teacher, you know, in other words, that this, this negative entity was set up to be like the good guy, bad guy kind of thing where he would test every, the tester, I think is what it was, is the way it was. Accuser. Became, You're thinking like, accuser. Accuser. Or yeah. was it? Accuser. Accuser. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so there is no point. Satan. The, the, the concept of, of a fallen angel like Satan in, it, it does not exist in the Jewish scriptures. That is a, yeah. a, a, a an addition that comes with the apocalypticism of Christianity. Yeah. yeah. And so in other words, the, the good, the good and the bad that we experience is a way for us to test ourselves. It's a way to, you know, like if you're going to college uh, hey, we'd all like to get a teacher that just lets us uh, not even have to take tests and just gives us an A, but we don't learn anything, okay? And the type of teachers that you like the most are the ones that sometimes you kind of hate for a little while because they don't <laughs> let you get by with anything. Right. They say, you know, okay, you got a B plus on this, go do it again. Go spend another year and do it again until you can get an A. You get an A minus, that's not good enough. You got to have an A and you want to, oh, you know, like this, but you finally hang in there and you do the work and you get that A and you get out of that class and you just love that teacher, you know, because yeah. he was not trying to be mean to you. He was just trying to say, look, you got to learn, you know, that way. So I, I would like to, yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm, it's interesting you have that on the show because I kind of believe that the state of consciousness and what people believe somehow carries into like if they're having a session. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, if anybody's on the show that uh, is watching the show that would like uh, to do a session that, um, really a demon believer or something. I mean, just for research purposes, I'd like to do a session. How can they I reach you, Regan? We got like two minutes. How can they reach you? Oh, okay. Um, uh, it's visit the afterlife.com. Real simple. Visit the afterlife. And there's two T's visit the afterlife.com. Um, there's some videos on there that talk, I'll, I'll give a lot more information about this. Um, some references to some books like um, Journey of Souls. It's sold over a million copies now. Um, There's a lot about lots of research people can read. Also, Jesus, one I just read, which is great, it's called Jesus and the Essenes. And it's about a man who remembered a past life where he was in the Essene community and he was a uh, teacher of Jesus. And he went through a whole bunch of sessions in that and they got more parts and it talks about Jesus's early life and John the Baptist, who was also with the Essenes and talks about their different personalities and how they were. 
And whether you want to read it as fiction or that it really was, it's a beautiful description of the uh, childhood of Jesus uh, that this man remembered from being there. And when they dug up where the Essenes community was, Everything that he said, where all the rooms were, where the meeting rooms and things end up being just exactly right, right, just what it was. Well, thank you so much, Regan. It's been so oh, fantastic. We're at the end of the I'm show. Sorry. We another, just have to have you back on again. Another whirlwind. Yeah, it yeah. is. Um, but I'd like to have you on with that other researcher, maybe as a dual guest in a future episode, maybe next season. And we can talk about the negative NEDs uh, that he has um, researched, and then you can kind of compare notes with what you've experienced and see if we can get to the bottom of it. I think that'd be a fascinating yeah. show. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just for my own my own self. Yeah. I, my, luckily, so far, all angels and love and good. That's all I've had to experience. Well, oh, great, time. great. Awesome. Well, I just want to thank you uh, for being on the show again, Brandon. Thank you, Father Chris. Thank you. We will be back. Okay, next week, Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern time, uh, Eastern time, for part two of Psychic seduction we'll continue on from where we left off and then we'll have plenty of time to take your questions and if there's no more questions on the subject it will just convert into an open lines open topic show okay but i really want to finish that topic while it's fresh and we're kind of on a theme this season so uh i'm looking forward to it we'll see you then um and uh, thank you jamie for being on the show and we'll see you out there in the ether god bless everyone thanks everybody